Good morning and welcome to another edition of the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Buck? Here. Senator Daly? Here. Senator Hammond? Here. Senator Lang? Here. Senator Pazina? Here. Senator Scheibel? Here. Senator Stone? Here. Chair Spearman? Here. Here. And so, uh, good morning and welcome everyone who's here with us in Carson City. Those of you who are joining us in Las Vegas and those who are joining us virtually. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, there are several ways you can participate in these meetings. In person here in Carson City and Grant Sawyer. Telephonically, you can submit a written comment or you can share your opinion on Nellis. And as usual, all of the exhibits that we see today would have been turned in by 8 o'clock on yesterday. When you testify, please, please, please move the microphone towards your mouth. I promise it won't bite you. Speak clearly and project your voice because we have people who are listening to us over the Internet. And if you don't project your voice, then they can't hear you. All committee-related information is available on Nellis, which is accessible at the legislator's website, and we'll take public comment at the end. Please note that pu public comment is limited to two minutes, two minutes, and it cannot, will not, and shall not contain anything that we talked about with regard to any of the bills that we uh, hear today. A reminder to all those who testify that pursuant to uh, NRS 218.5e, it is unlawful for anyone to knowingly uh, present false facts when testifying before a, <clears throat> a legislative committee. Anyone who does so is guilty of a misdemeanor, and the chair or any member of the committee may ask you to, for proof uh, to verify your comments. And so with that, uh, let's get started. We'll start with our work session first. Uh, Mr. Megalejo. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Cesar Magrejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, I will make a note that Senate Bill 57, uh, sponsored on behalf of the Division of Insurance, has been pulled from today's work session, and we will schedule that for a later date. Uh, so the first bill on the work session is SB 78. Uh, this bill is sponsored. This bill makes various changes relating to property. It's sponsored by Senator Donate and Assembly Members Gonzalez and Peters. It was heard on March 8, 2023. And the bill revises provisions relating to residential rental property and, and landlord and tenant resp responsibilities. Uh, there are several amendments that were submitted by Senator Donate during the, the hearing of the bill. I will note for the committee members that amendment number seven and amendment number eight, which makes revisions to section eight of the bill, ha uh, were proposed after the, the hearing of the bill. And amendment number seven amends subsection one of section eight to require a landlord to send a written notice 30 days prior before the landlord may transfer, sell, assign, or report the outstanding amount <coughs> to a collection agency or credit reporting agency to the last known address of the tenant, summarizing all outstanding amounts owed by the tenant and stating that if said outstanding amounts are not paid within 30 days, the landlord will transfer, sell, assign, or report the outstanding amount to a collection agency or credit reporting agency. Amendment number eight amends subsection two of section eight to require that any action for the enforcement of any provision of a residential lease agreement be commenced by any, any party to the residential lease agreement not later than two years after the termination of the tenancy established by the residential lease agreement. Uh, and I will remind the committee members there is a second amendment that was proposed the date of the hearing by Mackenzie Warren Kay, representing Manufactured Home uh, Community Owners Association. And this proposes to amend the bill to provide that the provisions of this bill do not apply to a manufactured home. And Madam Chair, that's all the amendments. Thank you, committee. Uh, are there any questions, clarification? Okay, Senator Scheibel. Um, I don't see the sponsor here, but could we clarify that the amendment from the Manufactured Homes Organization was a friendly amendment? Madam Chair, says I'm going to for the record, and uh, Senator Scheibel, yes, it was a friendly amendment. Additional questions? All right, with that, I will entertain a motion. Amendment do pass. I have a motion from the Vice, Vice Chair Lang. Do I have a second? Second from Senator Scheibel. Any further questions? If I could, uh, Madam Chair, um, I'd, I'd like the bill. I'd like to look at it a little bit more, but uh, I'm going to vote yes on it right now, but reserve a right to, to change my vote on the, on the floor. Okay. Duly noted. 
So we have a first from Vice Chair, and we have a second from Senator Scheibel. Uh, all those in favor, yay? Yay. yay. Opposed, no? And we have all yes, with the exception of Senator Buck uh, and Senator Stone. Uh, so let the record show that, and I'll assign this floor statement to Senator Donate. I forgot to say this. There's an overflow room in 2144. So if anyone can't find a seat here, there's an overflow room in 2144, and that's down the middle hallway. Uh, you can find it there, okay? All right. Mr. Megalohe. Thank you, Madam Chair, Cesar Magrejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, Senate Bill 131 is our next uh, bill in the work session. This revises provisions relating to reproductive health care sponsored by Senator Canizaro, Senators Lang, Scheibel, Gwynn, and Spearman et al. And it was heard on February 20th, 2023. Uh, Senate Bill 131 prohibits the governor from surrendering or issuing an arrest warrant for a person who is charged with a criminal violation in another state if the alleged violation involves the provision aiding a receipt of, a re of reproductive health care services unless the alleged violation is a crime in the state. The executive department's agencies are also prohibited to use resources or provide information in support of an investigation or proceeding that was started in another state involving the provision or assistance with or receipt of, of reproductive health care services except under certain circumstances. In addition, the bill prohibits a health care licensing board from denying someone a license or disciplining a licensee for providing or aiding in the provisions of reproductive health care services. This prohibition also applies for, to individuals who have been found guilty, disciplined, or are subject to other sanctions under the laws of another state or territory of the United States for providing, aiding, or pro providing in, uh, reproductive health care services in the services would have been legal and in accordance with the standards and uh, for the practice of the relevant health profession in this state. Finally, the bill requires health care licensing boards to examine the feasibility of offering opportunities for reciprocal li licensure to providers of health care who provide reproductive health care services in other states. And Madam Chair, there were no amendments for this bill. Thank you. Committee questions? I'll entertain a motion. I have a motion by Vice Chair Lang, second. Second by Senator Scheibel. Any further questions? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Yes. Chair Spearman, I'm going to uh, vote yes on this today. Uh, um, I am at angst because of the parent notification, um, the age of this. However, I don't believe in criminalizing women um, who come here for abortion. I feel that they're victims already. So I'll vote yes today and then reserve my right on the floor. Yeah, and I think I'm not the sponsor, but I think during the uh, hearing, uh, we went through that piece, you know, <laughs> rather exhaustively, and uh, it's already in statute what needs to be done with respect to parent notification, but I respect that. And so, uh, Senator Hammond, no? Senator Stone, no? Okay. Let the record show it's all affirmative with the exception of Senator Hammond and Senator Stone, and Senator Buck reserves the right uh, to change her vote on the floor. We'll assign the floor statement to Senator Canizaro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Cesar Magrejo, Committee Policy Analyst, uh, for the record. Uh, next bill is Senate Bill 145, which provides the provisions relating to employee misclassification, sponsored by Senator Lang and Don Donate, and it was heard on March 6, 2023. Uh, Senate Bill 145 requires the Labor Commissioner and Division of Industrial Relations of, of the Department of Business and Industry, the Employment Security Division of the Department of Employment, Training, and Rehabilitation, Department of Taxation, and the Attorney General to share amongst their respective offices information relating to suspected or actual employee misclassification, regard, regardless of whether the information is declared confidential. If under Nevada Revised Statute, such information is declared to be confidential, must be maintained under the terms and conditions required by statute. Further, the bill deletes provisions which impose a tier system of penalties against the, an employer for the misclassification of employees and instead requires that any administrative penalty imposed by the Labor Commissioner is, is a fine of $5,000 for each employee who, who is misclassified. The bill also requires that all money from administrative penalties collected by the commissioner to be de de deposited in a separate account within the state general fund, which may be used to pay for additional staff for the Office of the Labor Commissioner and BNI. 
Uh, finally, the bill eliminates the task force on employee misclassification and repeals provisions setting forth its duties. Uh, there is an amendment proposed by Senator Lang. It's a conceptual amendment attached to this work session document, which is to amend subsection 2 of section 3 to require that the administrative penalty imposed by the Labor Commissioner includes issuing a warranty to an employer for the first offense of misclassifying or otherwise failing to properly classify a person as an employee and imposition of a fine of $5,000 for a second or subsequent offense of willfully misclassifying an employee. And Madam Chair, that's all the amendments. Thank you, committee. Any questions? Senator Daly. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I just wanted to say that I won't be supporting this. Uh, I did speak with the sponsor of the bill and several other people. Uh, my problem is the portion about using penalty money, uh, various things to fund an agency. I just uh, think it's a slippery slope. If we were talking about doing the same thing with OSHA or a variety of other agencies, I think uh, we, we'd have a lot more uh, pushback. I just think it's a bad look uh, if the person investigating you, uh, job potentially depends on what type of penalty that you, you might be assessed. And uh, so I can't support it. I did speak with the sponsor. She knows. Uh, and... Uh, Appreciate it. Thank you. Additional questions? Okay. All right. Uh, with that, I will entertain a motion to um, amend to pass. So uh, I have a motion by Senator Scheibel. Do I have a second? Second, second by Senator Bazzina. Any further questions? All those in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. So let the record show that's unanimous with the exception of Senator... Yeah, Senator Daly and Senator Buck. You got to speak up. Senator Buck and Senator Daly um, vote no. And so, um, Vice Chair, I'll sign the floor statement to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, uh, Cesar Magrejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Our next bill is Senate Bill 147 which makes changes related to employment, sponsored by Senator Lang, and it was heard on February 22nd, 2023. Uh, this bill requires an employee's unpaid wages and earned compensation to be paid immediately upon being laid off by an employer. If an employer fails to pay the wages or compensation of a laid off employee within three days of being laid off, the wages or compensation continue at the same rate for each day the laid off employee goes without their final paycheck until paid in full or up to 30 days, whichever is less. The bill also provides that wages include amounts owed to a laid off empl employee. Uh, Senator Lang has submitted a draft mock up that's attached to this uh, work session document. And the First Amendment is to add a new section to the bill to define lays off, laid off, and layoff. And the Second Amendment is amend subsection 1 of section 2 to delete or lays off and or layoff. Uh, number three is to add a new subsection, section two, to provide that when an employer lays off an employee or is on call layoff, the wages <coughs> earned and unpaid at the time of such layoff shall become due and payable immediately. Number four is add a new subsection, section two, to provide that whenever an employer lays off an employee, the compensation earned and unpaid at the time of such a layoff shall become due and payable if the employee, be, employee submits to the employer a written request within three days of the time of, of the layoff for the payment of such compensation. Uh, amendment number five is the amend paragraph A of subsection one, section three, to delete or laid off. And number six is to add two new paragraphs to subsection one or section three to provide that if an employer fails to pay the wages or compensation of the employee, number one, within three days after the wages of the laid off employee become due, or number two, within three days of the date of which the laid off employee submits a written request with an employer, the wages or compensation of the employee continue at the same rate from the day the employee resigned, quit, was discharged, or laid off until paid for or for 30 days, whichever is less. I'm not sure that's all the amendments. Thank you. Committee, any questions? Senator Daly. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And I didn't uh, get a chance to speak with the sponsor uh, on this one. I did speak with a couple of the uh, people that were working on it uh, with her. So, And I didn't see the amendment until just, just the other day as well. Um, and when I read the amendments, I, I think I understand the intention, but I, it, it's awkwardly written, at least uh, my understanding. There's no definition for compensation. They were trying to delineate between wages and then other compensation. 
Um, so I don't think I can support it, uh, but uh, I wouldn't presume to work on it without the permission and blessing of the sponsor. But uh, And I didn't have time to do any of that. So I'll, I'll be no today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Mr. Saltero. You want to come up and can you address that? Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. For the record, Randy Saltero. Uh, to, uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, to... Uh, no, just go direct. Go direct. Thank you. To Mr. Daly, uh, I, we did speak in, in your office and talk about this. Um, this is uh, some language that uh, we have been working on quite a bit, and I, I believe that we are in the right place. I think that uh, uh, um, LCB is... is uh, who drafted this language. We've, we've gone through a lot of different steps on this, and I know that uh, we've been working with uh, uh, Ms. Kramer from the Resort Association, and this is a, a, an issue that ca got brought up uh, uh, in the, with the Resort Association, uh, their facilities, and to address this, and, and kind of a companion bill to something we did uh, last session as well. And, and, and maybe I think that uh, Ms. Kramer can a offer some more uh, insight to that and how we got to where we're at today. Good morning, committee. Misty Grimmer uh, with the Ferrara Group representing the Nevada Resort Association. Um, as we testified in the hearing, in the resort hotel industry, we have a lot of employees who are on the on-call status because the ebb and flow of our, of our business requires us to have a, you know, we have our base group of employees, but then because of whatever the business, the, the, the market requires that day, we'll have a lot of people that we will call in. And so we do end up with a lot of people that are officially on laid off status, but they're also on on call status so that anytime we need them, we can call them back. And that may be every week, it may be, um, you know, every, every couple weeks, it may be come in for a week at a time. Um, and those employees appreciate being on that on call status. And so, <clears throat> So that explains the reason why there's, there's sort of a delineated definition in Section 2. Um, but the thing is with those employees, we wanna, they want to be able to maintain their, their PTO time, their vacation time, whatever other type of compensation they have that's outside of their wages, their seniority, um, all of those things. A lot of our union contracts actually cover these things already, but of course not all the properties are union. So the goal of the amendment is that if the employee is laid off their wages, so whatever money they're owed for the time that they've worked is immediately due within the three days as the bill specifies, but that their, their other compensation such as PTO and things along those lines, section four, it does allow the employee the opportunity that if they do want to be paid out all of those, they just need to tell the employer and then the employer can pay them out all of those other benefits as well as the wages. I hope that helps explain, because it is kind of a, I, I can see where it could create some confusion. So I hope putting that on the record clarifies the goal. Senator Daly. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I did speak with both of you and you explained those, those things. Uh, and, and as I said a second ago is, <clears throat> I think I understand the goal, I, I just, don't know that the language is as clear as it as it could be. I still have some concerns with it. I didn't have time, and I wouldn't presume, as I said earlier, to uh, try to make any changes without the blessing and permission of the sponsor. And I didn't get that. So, as the language is, uh, you know, I'm no. I understand the goal. If I if it's okay, if uh, I try to clarify that uh, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure it's captured. Because when I read it, I understand the hotel industry. I understand the uh, um, show, the, the IATSE's uh, issue. A lot of these issues are covered in collective bargaining agreements, a lot of the ones that, that I'm familiar with as well. Uh, but when we do this, it's going to cover all employers, and it needs to be clear on what exactly is going to happen. Uh, and, and it is just not as clear as it could be in my mind, and, and that's, uh, that's why I was having the issues. Uh, um, and concerns. I, I understand your intent and don't oppose that. I'm just trying to say that the words don't meet it. So, 
So um, here's what I'm going to do. Um, the, the language needs a little bit more clarification. If there's any way to tweak, uh, we'll move the vote on this to Friday. Please get with the sponsor, Senator Daly. Um, get with the sponsor uh, and the uh, other presenters, and let's make sure that we have it tight. Because Friday we will take a vote on this. We'll table the agenda. We'll table that from the agenda right now. And, okay? and if the sponsor of the bill is okay with that, like I said, I, I wasn't going to do any of that without permission and blessing. <laughs> yep, we're good. We're good. Thank so you. we'll table that for right now. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Cesar Magrejo, Community Policy Analyst. Uh, next bill is Senate Bill 167, which prohibits the imposition of step therapy under certain circumstances. Uh, this bill was sponsored by Senator Dondero Loop and Senator Spearman et, et al. Uh, it was heard on March 10, 2023. <clears throat> this bill prohibits certain insurers from imposing a step therapy protocol for a drug that is prescribed to treat a psychiatric condition if the prescribing healthcare practitioner reasonably expects such each drug required to be dispensed according to the step therapy protocol to be ineffective. A health insurance policy issued or renewed on or after July 1, 2023 must include the required coverage and any provisions of the policy that conflict is void. In addition, the Commissioner of Insurance is authorized to spend or revoke the certificate, certificate of authority of certain health insurance providers that fail to comply with the pro prohibition against imposing a step therapy protocol for a drug prescribed to treat a psychiatric condition. Uh, Jeanette Fells, representing the National Alliance of Mental Illness, Nevada Chapter, proposes the following amendments. Um, the First Amendment is to amend subsection 3 of sections 1, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 11, and 12, and subsection 6 of section 15 to revise the definition of practitioner uh, to provide that as used in these respective sections, practitioners refer to psychi psychiatrists and certain physician assistants who hold a license issued by the Board of Medical Examiners or State Board of Osteopathic Medicine, as well as advanced practice registered nurses with a psychiatric population of focus. In addition, the definition includes a primary care provider in consultation with a practitioner if the closest practitioner in the plan's network is located 60 miles or more from the patient. Amendment number two is to add a new subsection within the sections 1, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 11, 12, and 15 to define step therapy protocol. And number three is to amend subsection one of sections 1, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 11, and 12, and subsection three of section 15 to, pre to replace the, the provisions proposed in the bill with new provisions prohibiting a health benefit plan that provides coverage for prescription drugs from requiring an, an ins and insured to submit to a step therapy, pro step therapy protocol before covering a prescription drug, which is approved by the Food and Drug Administration with indications of an off-label use with published, published medical evidence that is prescribed to treat a psychiatric condition if the prescribing practitioner re reasonably expects each drug required to be dispensed according to the step therapy protocol to be ineffective. And Madam Chair, that's all the amendments. Thank you. Committee, any questions? And I think this was a bill that we uh, heard exhaustively too. And for those uh, who need it, this is probably going to be a lifesaver. So uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion. I have a motion from Vice Chair Lang. Do I hear a second? Second. Second from Senator Daly. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. And let the record show that the motion carries unanimously, and I'll assign this floor statement to Senator Dondero Lute. Thank you, Madam Chair. Cesar Magrejo, Community Policy Analyst. Our next bill is Senate Bill 195, which provides provisions related to cannabis. It's sponsored by Senator Gwen Spearman, Harris, Stone, Buck, Donate, Dondero Loop, and Scheibel, and Assembly Members Jaeger and Watts et al. And it was heard on March 8, 2023. Uh, this bill revises various provisions relating to disciplinary action taken by the Cannabis Compliance Board against a holder of a license or registration card issued by the board. Specifically, it authorizes the board to resolve any disciplinary action by entering into a consent or settlement agreement with the license 
but with the licensee or registrant so long, so long as the terms are discussed and approved at the meeting of the board. The bill sets forth mitigating circumstances that the board is required to consider in determining whether to approve or modify the terms of a consent or settlement agreement. If a licensee or registrant is alleged to have committed multiple violations, the bill requires such violations to be charged as a single complaint. Further, the bill limits the amount of a civil penalty that the board may impose to, for a single violation to $20,000 and provides additional actions that the board may take to remedy a violation. In addition, the bill requires the board to establish regulations that authorize a holder of an ownership interest in a cannabis establishment to transfer all or any portion of the ownership interest to another party who is qualified to hold it, an ownership interest in, an, in a cannabis establishment. An applicant for a license is required to pay the board the actual costs paid to conduct the background checks in connection to the application or transfer of ownership. Finally, the board is prohibited from charging a licensee, registrant, or applicant for a license or, or registrant any fee, cost, fine, or other charge that is not expressly authorized by statute. The Nevada Cannabis Association proposed uh, several amendments. First amendment is to amend subsection 2 of section 3 to replace uh, the board with the appropriate board agent. Number two, delete sections eight and nine, which make conforming changes concerning the proper placement of section three in Nevada revised statutes. And number three is to amend section 13 to make the provisions of the bill effective upon passage and approval. And I'm sure that's all the amendments. Thank you. Committee, questions? Okay. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> one, two, all together now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I have a motion from Senator Scheibel, second from Senator Buck. Any further questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. And let the record show that it passes unanimously, and I will assign 195 to Senator Wynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, says our medical Rail committee policy analyst. Our next bill is Senate Bill 249, which revises provisions relating to cosmetology, sponsored by Senators Lang, Hammond, and Spearman. And it was heard on March 20th, 2023. Senate Bill 249 makes various changes to provisions governing the practice and licensure of cosmetology, hair design, aesthetics, nail technology, shampoo technology, and electrologists. Um, and, the, and as well as changes to the State Board of Cosmetology. There are several amendments that were discussed during the hearing of the bill, which were proposed by the State Board of Cosmetology. I will note for the committee members that amendment number two, which is to amend subsection 4C of section four to increase the time frame from three days to seven days for when a citation shall be deemed to have been received by a person if the citation is mailed by certified mail. This was an additional amendment that came in after the hearing to address some of the questions from the committee members, and as well as an amendment number four, which is to amend subsection four of sections 20, 22, 24, 25, and 26 to provide that a person admitted for examination for a license as a cosmetologist, hair designer, advanced esthetician, esthetician, or nail technologist, respectively, must have documented practice of the occupation for a period of four years outside of this state, including without limitation in any other state, territory, or country, as determined acceptable by the board of its designees, of its, of its design. Um, and I'm sure that's all the amendments. Thank you, committee. Questions? I'll entertain a motion. A motion from Vice Chair Lang, second from, from Senator Hammond. Uh, any further questions? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed nay. Let the record show that the motion carries unanimously and Vice Chair Lang, full statement. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Cesar Mugrejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Our next bill is seven, Senate Bill 270, which revises provisions governing massage therapists and sponsored by Senator Scheibel, and it was heard on March 22, 2023. This bill enacts the Interstate Massage Compact, as well as the bill increases from four to five the number of uh, from four to five, the number of the Board of Massage Therapy members needed to constitute a quorum for the purpose of transacting the business of the board. 
Uh, Nick Vanderpool, representing the Board of Massage Therapy, has submitted an amendment, which is to uh, amend paragraph A of Article 2 and Article 7 in Section 2 to correct language referencing active military member. This is in order to keep provisions within the interstate compact identical across all states. And Madam Chair, that's all the amendments. Thank you. Committee questions? Senator Daly. Not, not, a, not a question, Madam Chair, just a, just a comment is, uh, I'm gonna be voting for it, it's like pushing against the tide. I'm still not a fan of compacts, but still gonna vote for it, thank you. Additional questions or comments? Uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion. Have a, a motion from Senator Buck and second from Vice Chair Lang. All those in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. And the motion carries. Uh, Senator Scheibel, you want to take that for a statement? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Cesar Magarejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Our next bill is Senate Bill 275, which revises provisions related to manuf manufactured home parks. Uh, this bill is sponsored by Senator Daly, and it was heard on March 27, 2023. Uh, this bill requires the Housing Division of the Department of Business and Industry to calculate and publish on or before August 1 of each year the maximum annual rent increase percentage for a manufactured home park for the following fiscal year. The annual rent increase percentage must equal to 60% of of the June annual 12-month average change in the consumer price index for all urban consumers, Western region, uh, most recently, wh which was most recently published by the United States Department of Labor. The division is required to maintain such information on its internet website for at least two years. The bill prohibits a landlord, his or her <coughs> agent, or employee of a manufactured home park to increase rent of a tenancy that is from month to month and not a long-term lease unless the amount of the increase does not exceed the maximum annual rent increase percentage calculated by division plus the amount of pass-through expenses actually incurred by the landlord. Landlord, his or her agent or employee is authorized to apply to the division for an exemption from the rent limits for certain tenancies if the cost of operating the manufactured home park exceeds the amount that the park will earn with the increase in rent. <coughs> the division is further required to adopt regulations to establish the application process. Uh, Senator Daly has submitted an, an amendment that's attached to this work session document, which is to add a new subsection in section four to require that the application submitted by a landlord, his or her agent or employee to the division for an exemption from the rent limitations, include a report prepared by a certified public accountant licensed in this state demonstrating the need for the exemption. Uh, amendment number two is to amend the effective date of this bill, which the work session document states um, amend the bill to July 2024. However, there's been a correction and the, the amendment will actually uh, make this bill effective on July uh, 1, 2023 for all other purposes. Thank you. Uh, committee, questions or comments? Now, I just want to make one comment, and uh, I'm going to sign the floor statement to you, Senator Daly, but uh, I need this to go on the record, and I hope we'll say the same thing on the floor. I was rather disturbed when some of the residents talked about retaliation. And so I want to be clear that the NRS does address that, and I think it's 118.210B. And so I want to make clear that, that if there is any retaliation because someone has reported that there is, has there been some type of injustice made, uh, that we will take swift action. Okay, thank you. Uh, additional questions, comments? I'll entertain a motion. Amended to pass. I have a motion from Senator Scheibel, amended to pass. I have a second from Senator Pazina. Further questions? All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You know, Senator, Senator Stone, Senator Buck, Senator Hammond. So let the record show that the uh, vote is yes, with the exception of Senator Stone, Buck, and Hammond. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Cesar <coughs> Bungrail, Community Policy Analyst. Our last bill on the work session today is Senate Bill 283, which revises uh, certain provisions relating to health care records. It was sponsored by Senator Pazina and Donate et al. Uh, it was heard on March 22nd, 2023. This bill requires a custodian of health care records or a person who owns an ambulance in this state <coughs> to electronically transmit a copy of requested health care records in an electronic format to an authorized uh, person if the authorized person requests the health care records to be furnished electronically. 
The bill sim similarly requires an insurer or employer to electronically transmit any health care records concerning an occupational injury or uh, disease to an injured employee or other authorized person in an electronic format upon request. The bill prohibits a custodian of health care records, a person who owns an ambulance in the state, an insurer, an insurer, and an employer from charging a fee from uh, furnishing a copy of health care records in an electronic format if such records are maintained electronically. Uh, Kaylin Card Cardavani from the Nevada Justice Association has proposed uh, the attached amendments. Uh, number one is to amend section one to delete the reference and applicability to a person who owns and operates an ambulance. In addition, amend subsection two within section one to authorize a custodian of health care records to charge a fee of up to $15 for furnishing such records electronically. And amendment number two is amend section three to add or third party administrator to additionally require a third party administrator to upon request electronically transmit any health care records concerning an occupational injury or disease to an injured employee or other or other authorized person in an electronic format. In addition, the amendment uh, includes an amendment to subsection two of section three to authorize an insurer, employer, or third party administrator to charge up to a $15 fee for furnishing uh, records electronically. Madam Chair, that's all the amendments. Thank you. Um, Questions, comments, committee? I just have a question, Senator Pazina. These are friendly amendments? Okay. Right. Additional questions or comments? Okay, I will entertain a motion. I have a motion from Senator Daly to uh, amend the pass and second from Senator Scheibel. Additional questions? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. And the motion carries unanimously. And Senator Pazina, I'll give you the floor tape statement, okay? Thank you. And I believe that concludes, <clears throat> concludes our work session for today. Um, and we have a bill hearing that we will go to now. And I have no idea why so many people are here for this bill. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. <laughs> um, so we're going to go to Senate Bill 302. Is that where I am? No, Senator Orenshaw. And I'll ask everybody, uh, I don't know if I said it at the beginning, but <clears throat> make sure that your phones are on silent, okay? And when we get to the uh, public testimony, uh, we're going to go uh, two minutes each and would hope that those who are here, those who are listening on the phone, and those who are in Las Vegas uh, would try to accommodate us, okay? Because we got a couple more bills. Senator Orenshaw, begin when you're ready. Good morning, Chair Spearman, members of the Senate Commerce and Labor Committee. Uh, for the record, my name is James Orenshaw. I represent State Senate District 21 uh, down in Southern Nevada. I wanna thank uh, Chair Spearman and the committee for the opportunity to come before you today and present Senate Bill 302, which addresses an issue that affects the lives and well-being of m many transgender individuals in our state, as well as across this country. Gender-affirming services are medically necessary treatments for individuals who experience gender dysphoria a serious condition that results from a mismatch between that person's gender identity and the sex that was assigned to them at birth. These gender-affirming services can include hormone therapy, surgery, or counseling, and are crucial for the well-being of transgender and non-binary people. Unfortunately, there are approximately 11 states where providing or receiving gender-affirming services can lead to legal consequences for that person or their health care provider. Those consequences include criminal prosecution. Reportedly, another 21 states are considering and are working to introduce legislation that may similarly restrict and possibly criminalize the provision of gender-affirming care and services. I believe that this not only denies these individuals access to essential health care, but also subjects health care providers to the risk of losing their licenses, damaging their professional reputation, and facing legal sanctions. According to the Human Rights Campaign, in 2022, legislators across the country introduced 315 bills that were considered discriminatory and anti-LGBTQ+. 29 of those bills passed into law. The majority of these bills targeted the transgender and non-binary community. So far this year, 
The Human Rights Campaign is tracking 340 bills that are considered discriminatory towards the LGBTQ plus community. 150 of these bills across the country would specifically restrict the right of transgender people to gender affirming care. Some of these measures impose punishments for providers of health care with up to 10 years in prison and a fine of up to $15,000. That's, that's a bill that's in, pending currently uh, in the Alabama legislature, Senate Bill 184. It is crucial that we enact laws in Nevada to protect health care providers and individuals from being prosecuted for involvement in aiding or receipt of gender affirming services. By doing so, we can ensure that individuals in need have access to these life affirming treatments and that health care providers can offer these services without fear of legal repercussions. Half a dozen states have enacted laws similar to SB 302, shield laws. And currently, I believe that another 21 states are considering legislation similar to Senate Bill 302 in their state legislatures. Chair Spearman, Senate Bill 302 is a step in the right direction. Section 1 prevents health care licensing boards from disqualifying or disciplining individuals for providing or assisting in gender affirming services if those services are lawful and consistent with professional standards in Nevada. Section 2 prohibits the governor from surrendering or arresting a person in Nevada who is charged in another state for a crime involving gender affirming services unless those acts would constitute a criminal offense in Nevada. Section 3 extends this protection to state agencies and the executive department which are prohibited under the bill from assisting investigation in investigations or proceedings initiated by other states related to gender affirming services except under certain limited circumstances. Section 4 requires health care licensing boards to examine the feasibility of providing licensing for out-of-state providers of gender-affirming services to ensure that people seeking these services have access to the necessary care. To be clear, Senate Bill 302 is drafted to ensure that care that falls below the acceptable standard of care or is otherwise not lawful in Nevada will not be protected under the bill. Therefore, if that care is not lawful within our state, this bill would not protect that care. Chair, I am pleased to be joined today by Andre Wade, State Director from Silver State Equality, who will provide an overview of the need for SHIELD laws for gender affirming care. Also with me is John Phoenix, known to, to me and to many of his patients as Rob, from the Huntridge Family Clinic in Las Vegas. He will provide a point of view from the provider's perspective. I'm also joined today by two moms of children who identify as transgender. Elvira Diaz is here in Carson City. She will briefly share her story about once accessing gender-affirming care by having to go out of state for her son. Additionally, Chair, with your permission, we have Elizabeth Stern at the Grant Sawyer State Office Building. She and her transgender son moved from Texas to Nevada in 2021. I'm grateful to the two moms who've demonstrated the courage to briefly share their stories with you, Chair Spearman, and the committee today. With your permission, Chair Spearman, if I could turn it over to Mr. Wade and then to Mr. Phoenix. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Orenshaw, for sponsoring this very important bill, um, and it's timely. And good morning, Chair Spearman, um, Vice Chair Lang, and members of the committee. As stated, my name is Andre Wade, and I'm the State Director for Silver State Equality, a statewide LGBTQ plus civil rights organization here in Nevada. And I'd just like to note that today is Equality Day here in the legislature, so there are many LGBTQ plus Nevadans and allies in Carson City. Um, on February 18, 2022, the Texas Attorney General issued an opinion letter answering the question of whether certain types of gender-affirming medical care could constitute child abuse under existing Texas law. The Attorney General's opinion was that, yes, certain types of gender-affirming care could meet the definition of child abuse. Shortly after uh, the Attorney General issued his opinion letter on gender-affirming care, the Governor of Texas issued a directive ordering the Department of Family and Protective Services to investigate reports children uh, receiving gender transitioning procedures. All of this is overwhelmingly absurd and hard to take given that gender affirming care is delivered in age appropriate evidence based ways and decisions to provide care are made in consultation with doctors and parents. Collectively representing more than 1.3 million doctors across the United States, every major medical and mental health organization, including the American Medical Association, the American Ac Academy of Pediatrics, and the American Psychological Association, recognizes that it is medically necessary to support people in affirming their gender identity. The Child Welfare League of America, a coalition of hundreds of private and public agencies, has been around since the 1920s, released a statement opposing redefining child abuse to include gender-affirming care. 
stating that they stand with national and local organizations in opposition to any type of redefinition of child abuse to include gender-affirming care for youth who are transgender or non-binary. The president and CEO of the Child Welfare League of America stated, providing appropriate, compassionate medical care for your child is not child abuse. The policy decisions that came out of Texas have reverberated across the United States, resulting in copycat laws and families fearing for the safety of their transgender children. We have worked for decades to encourage parents and families to accept their lesbian, gay, biromantic, or transgender children regardless of their religious and faith beliefs or lack of understanding of what it means to be LGBTQ+, because research done by Dr. Caitlin Ryan shows that the more a parent or guardian is accepting of their child, the less likely their child is to have negative outcomes. Now, thanks to policies and laws coming out of Texas, Arkansas, and Tennessee, just to name a few, parenting is now becoming criminalized when parents make the private, personal family decision to provide gender affirming care and services to their child. Now parents are moving to other states simply to access gender affirming care. Parents are panicking about what to do. It has been noted by Chase Strangio of the ACLU that there is no infrastructure in place to support thousands of people who are going to be deprived of care. Therefore, states like Nevada will need to take on the responsibility of providing care. The provisions of gender-affirming health care is also being criminalized. It has been said that opponents of gender-affirming care attempt to wield the concept of medical judgment as both a sword and a shield, preventing physicians from exercising their medical judgment to provide gender-affirming care while preventing them from providing care at all. Legislation like SB 302 have been enacted in states like California, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Illinois because state governments are overreaching into the lives and parental rights of families to stop them from letting their child access gender-affirming health care. Transitional care for youth isn't a single pro procedure. It's a series of conversations with patients and parents and guardians, referrals to providers, counseling, and depending on the patient, sustained hormone replacement therapy. The looming presence of anti-trans legislation has made it difficult for providers to plan for their future and offer a full range of medical services. We ask that you have the moral courage to do what's right by the people this bill aims to protect from harm. We must ask ourselves, who has the rights over their body's autonomy and who has the right to decide? Who has the right to equal protections under the law and who has the right to decide? I'll end by sharing something that people are probably sick of me saying, but back in 2021, uh, USA Today ranked Nevada as the best state for LGBTQ plus Americans to live. The index was measured by states hate crimes laws, laws protecting LGBTQ plus folks, and the per percentage of LGBTQ plus folks in each state. This and other recognition that Nevada receives for our innovative poor equality laws, the most inclusive equal rights amendment in the nation, and Nevada being the first state in the nation to remove discriminatory language in our state constitution on marriage are just further reasons and evidence that Nevada is poised to be the state that welcomes providers and seekers of gender affirming care. There are many reasons why organizations like the LGBTQ plus Center of Southern Nevada and our center in Reno and the LGBTQ plus serving organizations are fielding calls from families in other states who are trying to find out about laws and resources in Nevada to, to help their children. So thank you for your time and attention on this matter and thank you in advance for your support of SB 302. Good morning, Chair Spear, members of the committee, Senator Orenshaw. Thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. My name is John Phoenix. My preferred name is Rob. I do not have pronoun preferences. Today I'm here as an advanced practice registered nurse, the owner of the Huntridge Family Clinic, a harm reductionist, and the leading provider of gender affirming care in the state of Nevada. Since 2013, the Huntridge Family Clinic has been providing gender affirming care to residents of Nevada because they need access to health care. We currently participate in the medical care of over 1,000 transgender and gender diverse people living in Nevada. I'm also here as an advocate for access to medical care based on need, not on politics. Nevada, as Andre mentioned, has the distinction of being named in 2021 by USA Today as the number one state in America for LGBTQ people based on our history of policies and laws, prohibiting discrimination, supporting parenting laws, statutes against hate, laws protecting access to health care. In addition, Nevada continues to rank high among national organizations for our anti-discrimination efforts and our efforts to ensure that all Nevadans are treated with dignity and respect, valuing the person and their right to choose. On Trans Day of Visibility on March 31st, 2023, just a few days ago, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, released their report, Moving Beyond Change Efforts, 
evidence and action to support and affirm LGBTQ plus youth. In the executive summary, they report the key findings of this report. It is based on scientific research. Gender affirmation, including social transitioning and gender affirming medical care, are appropriate and beneficial for men, many gender minority youth. Policies that stigmatize, restrict, or exclude sexual or gender minority youth are harmful to children and adolescents. Legal prohibitions on gender affirming care, including medical care, are detrimental to LGBTQ plus children and adolescents. The report also outlines the associations that have taken measures to end sexual orientation change efforts and or gender identity efforts, and for the purposes of time, I will not be listing those. Also, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you, I think you should have a one page that's a PowerPoint, basically, slide that outlines the public health issues that we're facing with our adolescents. Um, Senator Orenshaw is holding it up. Um, that's outlining the public health issue that we are facing with our adolescent youth and rates of suicide and suicide ideations as they pertain to gender diverse individuals as well as cisgendered individuals. And what is alarming in this presentation is that over 45% of those individuals who identify as LGBTQ or gender diverse experience suicidal ideations compared to their cisgender peers of uh, cisgender women or girls as under 10%, uh, I'm sorry, under 25% and boys under 10%. That's a huge difference. There's also a difference in suicidal attempts in those same populations. Baby and Associates, which I've supported, submitted all these articles, um, recently um, published about the public health concerns that this current rise in anti-transgender legislation will have on transgender youth. Looking at transgender health research, they caution that all these anti-transgender legislations could exacerbate existing health disparities, facilitate risky health behaviors, and lead to preventable deaths, which makes this the public health concern. To address this public health concern, Baby and his associates identify how legislatures such as yourselves can build healthier communities by prioritizing legislation that reduces discrimination against transgender people and opens access to medical care such as what 302 will do. Um, I have included in my testimony that will be submitted um, several articles um, that highlight the scientific evidence, the peer-reviewed literature, on the public health emergency that this will create with respect to um, suicidal ideations and increase in suicidal rates in adolescents and youth. In this legislative session and many previous sessions, the critical nature of the health care provider shortage in Nevada and the public health impact on Nevadans this causes has been very well documented. Earlier in the 82nd legislative session, we heard on SB 131, which would provide similar protections to health providers related to reproductive health care. In addition, SB 302 will protect health care providers such as me who believe in providing medical care to patients who present based on their medical needs, not on political agendas. SB 302 will support the welcoming environment that Nevadas have created, Nevadans have created for our residents. SB 302 will allow us to attract medical professionals to our state to help alleviate the health care provider shortages by showing them that we respect their educational training and professional judgment. SB 302 will enshrine in, legislative, in Nevada's legislation our position as a leader in addressing public health crises and developing responses based on evidence-based science rooted in research and endorsed by almost every health care professional association in the United States. SB 302 will help to reduce health care shortages by fostering an environment that supports access to medical care in a safe environment for providers and patients, passing laws that respect a provider's clinical judgment for the delivery of medical care, endorses the development of a sustainable workforce. Providers will see how Nevada respects its residents when we pass legislation such as 302. Someone once said, if you build it, they will come. This is very true. This bill will support enrollment in our medical schools and our healthcare education programs as tomorrow's providers are looking for safe and affirming environments to live, learn, and practice. I provide much of that education for many of our providers in Nevada. I precept students from UNLV School of Medicine, from UNR School of Medicine, from the PA programs at UNR. I 
have medical students that come all the way from Reno to spend a month in our clinic at their expense to learn about providing gender affirming care. So this is something that our, our future providers are very interested in learning and making sure that we're doing this correctly. This bill brings essential protection so I can provide medical care to those in need without fear of being charged with a crime in another state where I don't even live or practice. This bill affirms the rights of parents to seek medical care for their children based on medical need without fear of rejection and isolation. One of the concerns raised during SB 131 hearings was that the bill like this would create a medical tourism in industry. I can't completely agree with that statement. Instead, I believe it will create an environment of acceptance and affirmation, which I think of when I see the home means Nevada license plates on Nevada cars. Unfortunately, many families are having to make difficult decisions about their children's health care. They are being forced to move because of legislation that puts the health and safety of their children at risk. For example, my office has been receiving calls from families in Utah and Arizona seeking access to Nevada to care in Nevada because their children can't get that medically necessary care in their home state. The Stearns family who is here today is just one of the many families impacted by the current legislation targeted at denying their child access to medical care. They represent the thousands of families across America that this bill will protect. Likewise, I represent the thousands of healthcare providers from all disciplines this bill will protect. In supporting SB 302, we are not asking you to compromise your beliefs or values. We are asking you to help families and patients make medical care decisions based on their assessments and that of their health care providers as what is in their best medical interest. We are asking you to protect access to health care for all Nevadans. Join the Stearns family. Join me in protecting the rights of families to access medical care and health care professionals and providing care by supporting passage of SB 302. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Andre. Chair Spearman, with your permission, I wonder if Elvira Diaz, who's here in Carson City, and Ms. Stearns at the Sawyer Building could speak. Then I'm happy to answer any questions you or the committee may have. Okay. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Elvira. Hello. Christian, right? Yes, I'm the Christian's mom. Yes, yes I remember. I remember. Thank you, mm -hmm. Senator Spearman. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Elvira Diaz, E-L-B-I-R-A-D-I-A-C. I am a senior civil engagement organizer with the Progressive Leadership uh, Alliance on Nevada Plan in support of Senate Bill 302. I am a mother of an 18-year-old transgender child who first came out to me when he was four and a half years old. I quickly began to try to understand what he was going through. How could I support him? And the resources that were available for us, especially I was a single, I am a single mom. We have, we faced many challenges, including having to go out of the state to get the medication because my insurance at that time didn't cover his gender affirming care. After years of traveling, I would stay for the medication. Finally, I was eventually able to get to Medicaid, but unfortunately that means that we also, in order to get Medicaid, living in the under federal poverty level. So I learned to be poor just to have a health care for my son. My son now, guess what? He's a young man and a proud of all his accomplishments and everything he has perceived together to ensure he has his medical uh, needs met. I am know that without this care, he could, not ha he could have faced uh, years of gender dysphoria that could have impaired his development. He never had that. He's so, so happy camper. SB 302 will allow parents of transgender children to make a private family decision to consent to health care without the overreach 
or the government criminalizing parenthood. Moreover, SB 302 will respect one's personal freedom and individual liberty to decide what medical rights and afford to them. Additionally, SB 302 will allow healthcare providers to practice in the state of Nevada without fear or retribution by also adding to the shortage of healthcare providers. Please, I urge you to support SB 302 to ensure that all parents are able to access gender affirming care from qualified providers for their children to thrive as the most authentic selves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Elvira, I think it was you and your son that helped us get the bill passed to uh, include transgender persons in the hate crimes legislation. Yes, we, we uh, when my son was four and a half, I, I, I did, you know, I was poor, so I take the bus, and we, uh, we lobbied for 120 days every day. We came here in 2011, and we have helped to pass four transgender bills, and I keep lobbying one, one more senator, and f six years later, uh, the Hecar bring passed unanimously. I think it's the first transgender uh, bill that is passing unanimously in the whole country, I think. So uh, the reason when you see a little kid like my son, four and a half, five years old, when came to talk to all of those, you guys, the, you know, you guys know weren't here in 2011, not all of you, but you were. So uh, the people see this is a real thing. And I remember lobbying one, um, I think it was the secretary, I don't know who this lady was, but every day I went with her, bring me my son and say, hi, please tell the senator to pass, and the senator was kicked for, and keep support three bills, and some of the bills just pass for one vote. So this is not, like for example, my son right now is going to have a top surgery, and I don't find a good healthcare provider to understand uh, surgery for trans to top surgery, so we're going to do it this summer before he finished high school. My son got accepted to Berkeley, California. I mean, I'm so proud that he's so happy because he doesn't need to deal with gender dysphoria. He needs to deal to be himself. And today, right now, he's going to school and he said, Mom, it's your turn to talk about me. He just won, this, uh, he won the, the job of the year for Boys and Girls Club in my area and he talked about his life, 12 minute speech that he did. So this is, this is amazing. And I feel here at home. Thank you guys, for me, we feel so welcome. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for your hard work. Uh, <clears throat> Governor Brian and Sandoval uh, actually signed that into law, so thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Um, you had someone else? Chair, yes, if, oh, if, mm -hmm. with your indulgence, Ms. Stern at the Sawyer Building. Thank you, Chair Sperman. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Stearns, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> and I'm the mother of a transgender child. Our son found the words to tell us that he was transgender when he was 11. He is now 17 and is thriving thanks to love and support from his family and his necessary affirming care. Our family moved here from Texas in November of 2021. We left our family, our friends, and our home after Texas lawmakers tried to pass laws that would criminalize our support of our son. We nervously watched sessions like this, wondering if they would pass a bill that would prohibit his health care providers from continuing his care, would label us child abusers, remove our children from us, and put us in jail. There was very little relief when the bills ran out of time and didn't pass because we didn't think that would be the end of it. Our son's doctors felt the same as we received calls from some letting us know that even though the bills hadn't passed and even though they knew how absolutely necessary his care was, they were now too scared to continue caring for minors. It turned out that we were all right to worry. Soon after we left Texas, they decided that affirming transgender children could already be considered child abuse 
and they began investigating families like ours. We are so grateful to be here now and to call such a beautiful, fun, and welcoming state our home. We are relieved to know that our son's medical decisions will continue to be between him, his parents, and the medical professionals. It is our hope and our need that this bill passes so that our family, other families of transgender children, and even transgender adults will not have to experience having their necessary life-saving care kept from them because of ignorance. Thank you. Chair Spearman, thank you very much for allowing my presentation on Senate Bill 302. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you. So uh, just before I ask the committee for questions, we did last session SB 109 uh, requiring state and federal state and local agencies to um, count transgender persons. So, um, Mr. Megalehill, can you find out if if we've done that or if we've ignored that? If there's any way to do that, and that was um, specifically for the purpose of bills like this, so that we know how many people we have a good account of how many people, so many people are suffering. So, uh, committee questions. Senator, Senator Daly. More of a, more of a comment than a, than a question. Uh, so th thank you, Senator, for uh, bringing the bill. And uh, I was hearing the um, testimony in the beginning of the deal, and much like abortion and many other things, it's, it's creating a divide in legislatures across the country. And uh, they actually had a segment on uh, Meet the Press this, this week regarding this, and they showed the states that have passed laws outlawing this and states that have passed laws like we're trying to do uh, for this. So it really is uh, kind of timely and, uh, you know, people are people. There's a small segment of the population that are in this uh, situation, but they deserve the same treatment as everybody else and uh, access to the care. Uh, so just a timely issue for me on uh, some of the stuff. So no real question. Uh, and thanks for bringing the bill. Thank you very much, Senator Daly. James Orangehall, State Senate District 21. I think we heard it best from the, the two moms who testified. I think these decisions need to be between the child, their family, and the doctor and healthcare provider. Additional questions? Senator Scheibel? Uh, thank you, Chair Spearman, and thank you all for your, your presentation and for taking the time to be here this morning. Um, mine is also kind of a comment, but I, I want to get your feedback as well, as I've been following some of the legislation that has been discussed, debated, and being passed in other states. Um, you know, my analysis is that some of the bills that other states are trying to pass or are passing that criminalize or prohibit gender-affirming care are very expansive. And so we're not just talking about preventing doctors from providing top surgery or preventing doctors from, um, you know, prescribing hormones, but we're talking about criminalizing doctors who agree to do something like... Um, address somebody by the pronouns that they prefer or change a medical record of a minor from, you know, Samuel to Samantha. And um, even if they're not, even if the care they're providing has nothing to do with uh, the child's puberty or their hormones, it has to do with, you know, a broken arm, but they just want to be called by the name that they identify with, the name that their parents call them. Those providers could even be coming under that umbrella. And so by passing SB 302, we would be protecting providers and parents who make these very simple choices within their own homes, within their own families, um, outside, you know, beyond the medical care, but just the way that they treat their children, how they respect their children, how they listen to their children and call them by the names that they prefer, use the pronouns they prefer, and, um, you know, and foster that environment of love and acceptance. Uh, uh, Chair Spearman, through you to Senator Scheibel, James Orange, I'll Just go to it. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Scheibel, when I was talking to uh, Andre and Rob this morning, you know, at one point I said, you know, it's a shame that states have to look at laws like this, but seeing what's happening to our uh, transgender brothers and sisters across the country with different state laws passing, I think it's important that Nevada uh, you know, in our statutes state that this this is between the child, the family, and the health care provider. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Uh, Senator, Senator Stone. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. I'm sorry. Oh, if, if I may, uh, Senator Sharple, just to, to add to that, uh, the remarks that you made, um, it's a growing concern. Um, initially, states started to ban uh, young people's access, but now it's expanding to adults as well or folks who are um, at least uh, age 26. And so we have folks that are, are stockpiling their hormones. Um, in Kentucky, they are forced to um, stop treatment in the middle of care. Uh, which can be damaging to anyone going through transition. Um, and so it's becoming a very concerning issue, um, not only from a legislative perspective, but from a health care concern as well. Madam Chairman, can I address, please? John Phoenix, for the record. So, Senator Scheibel, thank you for bringing up that point. Participating in the care of your child is a very stressful thing on a good day. Um, when you have to make decisions about their medical care, that becomes much more stressful. Dealing with pronouns in families is very difficult. I see adolescents in my practice on a daily basis, and I watch parents struggle with the grieving process of losing the child that was assigned at birth a female and now is identifying as a masculine person or vice versa, and the struggles that that creates within the families, and putting this additional burden on the families of having to leave their support systems like the Stearns family did because they couldn't access affirming care for their child because they felt that was the best thing for them to do is the intent of this law. So we don't have to lose that access for parents and we don't have to add one more stress. We've had an incredible amount of stress added to our plates because of the pandemic and many of our families are still struggling with pandemic related issues and we've lost housing and our rent has gone up and we just don't need one more Thing to add on to our already stressful plate. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Um, Senator Stone. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation, uh, Senator Orenthal. Um, you know, uh, my family's had experience with friends that have had kids that have had gender dysphoria. And I, I believe anybody that wants to undergo these treatments uh, 18 years or older should have the full right to do it without any problems. But we know that not every child that has sexual dysphoria um, maintains that identity um, as they progress through puberty. And I know of one instance where a pharmacist friend of mine who biological daughter uh, wanted to become a male and they went through the treatments. Um, they went to get uh, gender assigning surgery in Los Angeles. This was about 15 years ago. And in Los Angeles, there was not a physician that would provide the service, probably for issues that we're talking about here today. So they had to go to San Francisco and they got the gender affirming care for a top surgery. And then uh, unfortunately, uh, the child uh, claimed that they were confused and wanted to transition back to the true biological sex and had the top surgery mitigated. Um, so my, my uh, two questions. The first question is, this bill deals with criminal law and uh, being able to protect providers that are here or patients that are here or those that are seeking services here from being prosecuted by their states that they came from or actually you even are putting protections in from our own state boards. Does this legislation prevent civil litigation um, coming across state lines or within the state of Nevada between a patient and a provider, number one? Number two, um, I know we saw this, um, this provision in SB 131 with regard to what the governor's duties can be and can't be. So my, my question is, we have a separation of powers, the executive branch, the legislative branch. Is this more of a statement in this bill saying that the governor cannot extradite or can the governor um, assert his powers as the executive of this state and not be hampered by the legislative branch of the state? Thank you very much, Chair Spearman. James Orangewell, State Senate District 21. Uh, Senate Bill 302, I do not believe affects civil liability, uh, potential actions for medical malpractice uh, in Nevada statute. It doesn't affect that in any way. Uh, things that happen in other states would be governed by those state laws affecting tort liability and uh, whether there's uh, 
you know, medical malpractice there. As to the governor's duties on extradition, uh, certainly I've checked with the Legislative Council Bureau and uh, what they've told me is that th they believe this bill uh, meets constitutional muster, does not violate separation of powers. So I, I stand behind the bill and I, I believe it's good policy. I think that, again, these decisions, as you mentioned, need to be between the child, the family, and the health care provider. And I think that this bill goes a long way towards accomplishing that. Additional questions? Uh, I'm going to ask, I asked a question earlier to Mr. Mellihill. Will you tell me what we found out, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Cesar Mogarejo, Community Policy Analyst. Um, Senate Bill 109 uh, from the 2021 session enacted NRS 239B.026 which um, governs the request by governmental agencies of certain information related mm -hmm. to sexual orientation or gender or identity. Uh, just in summary, the bill, uh, this section requires that if a governmental agency is already asking for uh, demographic information, then they should also ask uh, for a gender and sexual orientation information as well. Um, we do have several reports that have been submitted uh, in 2021 calendar year and 2022 calendar year from several um, municipalities and Department of Health and Human Services as well as the system of higher education. So this is all aggregated data that demonstrates um, who did not answer these questions, uh, what their ethnicity is, uh, what their gender, preferred gender is, or if they, they uh, use another term other than uh, female or male. So we, the, the library within the Legislative Council Bureau and the Research Division does have several of these reports that are available on their website, and this is all aggregated data, just those numbers. Thank you, and um, I think, uh, Senator Ornshaw, you answered the question, but I'd like for LCB to weigh in on the constitutional, constitutionality uh, of the bill. And for those of you who don't know, LCB is our legal counsel, and whenever there is confusion uh, or diversion from an opinion, we always, we have to go with what LCB says, because every law that we pass, they will have to be the ones to defend it. So, LCB. Uh, uh, thank you. With respect to the separation of powers question, um, the, the authority of the governor to, to extradite is, is already governed by uh, legislation in Chapter 179. There are... Um, uh, c conditions um, that govern when the gov when the governor can extradite someone, and and under uh, the relevant section in Chapter 179, it is, you know, that there there's an indictment that's presented, and and there are certain formalities followed. Uh, this would just add one more um, circumstance where the uh, governor would not be able to extradite somebody, and that circumstance would be if uh, if, if an act occurred in Nevada um, and in compliance with Nevada law then a person, uh, the, uh, the governor would be prohibited from extraditing that person to another state um, for that action that occurred in Nevada under Nevada law. Thank you. Senator Stone, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Senator Daly, did you have a question? Okay. Um, yeah, I just have, just have a couple before we go to um, public testimony. Uh, well, first of all, I think you are partnering with the Gathering Place uh, on Taking, doing some care, and so I want to congratulate congratulate you on that, and I hope that that partnership will um, will build some type of capacity. Um, so, because working separately, you can get this much done. Working together, you can get a lot done. So, thank you for doing that. Um, I, I, for those of you who may not know, I um, also have a master's degree in theology, and one of the things that we looked at during um, seminary was some of the uh, traditional. Um, thought uh, as it related to religion, uh, mostly, quote, Christian religion. And I was um, appalled to learn that uh, once upon a time, left-handed people were not given communion. Uh, and um, I think uh, most people who have read um, the Bible know uh, about the prohibition of uh, women who are experiencing a biological monthly function, uh, how they were always cast out. Uh, and so a lot of times it takes, it takes time to catch up with reality, um, but um, I'm left-handed and I've been given communion and I've given communion, so 
there we go. Um, so, <laughs> Senator Orenshaw, you have anyone else? Ch Chair, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for hearing Senate Bill 302, and uh, I appreciate that you're on the committee's time. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so now with that, we will open uh, public testimony in support of Senate Bill 302, and we're going to have 20 minutes of that, and I would ask those of you who are coming forward, uh, if you come forward and someone has already said what you want to say, uh, just say ditto because there may be someone behind you that has additional information that we've not heard. And I want to make sure that we get, we accomplish this. We have two more bills after that. Otherwise, uh, we could be here, we would be here all day, but we can't do that. So though, if you're in support, come to the table in um, Carson City. If you're in support, come to the table in Las Vegas. Okay, so we'll start up here in Carson City. Yes, sir. Good morning, Dr. Barry Cole, B-A-R-R-Y-C-O-L-E, testifying for myself, but as a psychiatrist who has done the psychological evaluations prior to surgery, um, I've been involved in this arena and I've continued to work with young people and I would point out trans kids have the highest rates of suicide attempts and completed suicides. I live in my worst lawyerly nightmare that someday some vigilante in a state like Texas can file a lawsuit against me in Nevada for service provided in Nevada and that extradition would even be on the table. This sounds like the collapse of the United States, the balkanization. We're no longer a United States of America. We're 50 just random states doing whatever they want. In the DSM-5 latest edition that's recommended in the law, there's nothing about LGBTQ, but there's 10 pages about, uh, about gender dysphoria. And it talks about gender dysphoria that might approach significant levels because it says right here, there could be two million Americans that would self-identify as trans. If this bill isn't passed, my worst case fear, there's not gonna be anybody left to practice in Nevada. People will move to a state where it's safe to practice. I have two residents right now finishing at the University of Nevada Department of Psychiatry in Reno who wanna go into reproductive psychiatry. So they've already identified this as an interest area, a place for future study. And I think we really need to support this kind of legislation. Thank you, I support SB 302. Hello. Thank you, Senator Orenshaw. I didn't see where he went, but thank you so much for bringing this bill up, and thank you, all of you, for listening to us today. My name is Cy Burnaby, S-Y-B-E-R-N-A-B-E-I. I'm the Executive Director of Gender Justice Nevada. I'm also a proud transgender Nevadan, and I thank you for giving me time to talk about my journey with gender-affirming health care. Having top surgery saved my life. Before I was able to access that health care, I had, like many trans folks, a diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Because of that, I was very depressed, isolated, and I couldn't walk proudly because of the crippling dysphoria. I was intrins it was intrinsically tied to my mental health. I resorted to very dangerous ways of modifying my body, and I know of countless people in my community who have done very dangerous things to help with their gender dysphoria. People die when they cannot easily access this health care. My journey hasn't been easy or simple. It took a lot of conversations with friends, families, and doctors and therapists. It was imperative that my doctors were able to provide this kind of care without fear of losing their license or standing as a physician. This is life-saving health care. And when providers are not able to, are not available people, our community suffers. Like many other Americans who cannot obtain services, they resort to underground health care. We seek out medicine and even medical procedures that are very harmful. These unsafe solutions include pumping silicone and oils into our bodies and obtaining watered down and dangerous versions of testosterone and estrogen online. These things often result in terrible patient outcomes, including sepsis, permanent dam damage to the body, and even death. I am now living happily, and I only wish that all of my trans siblings are able to access this kind of life-saving health care <coughs> easily and without unnecessary barriers so that they can thrive like I do now. And I hope that doctors are protected because this health care saves lives. I support SB 302. Thank you. Morning. My name is Sebastian Alcala. I'm the program manager for Gender Justice. I work along with Sai in Las Vegas, Nevada. I have been queer all my life, um, but I've only been transitioning for the last four years. Learning what transitioning can include and then making the decision to move forward with it is a huge one. Both socially and medically going forward with this path can have dire consequences. 
Will I lose my family? Will I lose my job? Is this really what I want? Is this the right decision? Will I be ugly? Um, these are just a few of hundreds of potential outcomes that we have to weigh before we make a single decision to get a man's jacket or a dress. Um, luckily for me, I made the decision and I grew up a Nevada resident and everything I needed was available to me to pursue what I knew I needed to feel whole. I'm so honored to sit here before you today and I thank you for all the work that you've done to make sure that I have access to the care that I need and that's what brings me here. I'm filled with the responsibility because what you have given me is so powerful that I want to follow your lead and make sure that not only do we protect our own residents, but we protect anyone and everyone currently fleeing prosecution in their home state. We all know what's happening across the country and the introduction of anti-trans legislation, mainly targeting trans and gender diverse youth. But since 2011, Nevada has worked to become a place of inclusivity where its residents can thrive. And since we passed the ERA amendment, we've quickly elevated ourselves into a position where we have an opportunity to change and set the tone for what a thriving, inclusive city can look like for the rest of the country. I urge you to support this bill the same way that you have supported furthering inclusivity for all here. And again, I thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you. Let's go down to Las Vegas and we'll come back up to Carson City. Good morning, Chair and Committee members. My name is Jessica Munger, M-U-N-G-E-R. I'm the Program Manager for Silver State Equality. You've already heard from my colleagues, so I will keep it short. We are, of course, in strong support of SB 302. This is an opportunity to provide protections for providers who are essential to the health and well-being of my community. We've heard many times this legislative session so far about the necessity of gender-affirming care for the survival of trans and gender non-conforming people. In order for people to get this care in a safe way, because we know they will get it one way or another, providers need to be safe providing it. Thank you for your consideration. Good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. My name is West Yule, that's W-E-S-T-J-U-H-L, and I'm the Director of Communications and Campaigns for the ACLU of Nevada, and we are in support of SB 302. On a really basic level, protecting patients and medical providers from out-of-state, politically motivated prosecutions just makes sense if we're about liberty, right? But what I really need to say as a Nevadan who is non-binary and trans is that what I need from this legislature and from the state of Nevada in this moment we're in is safety. Safety is in short supply for our community these days. The ACLU is tracking 451 anti-LGBTQ bills across the country. And the hotter the temperature gets in this culture war or whatever this is, the more pressure that puts on our community and the more danger it creates for us. So I just wanna feel safe in the state of Nevada. I want you to know trans people have always existed. We're not going anywhere. I urge you to take this in every opportunity this session to keep transgender Nevadans safe. And you do that by explicitly protecting our rights. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I see one of our former colleagues, uh, Senator David Parks at the table, and just before you go, I just need to say this to everyone. Every bill that protected, advanced the rights of the LGBTQ plus community uh, in Nevada uh, was can be attributed to David Parks. He was the only openly um, gay person in the Senate until I got here, and he was my mentor. So thank you, David, for you laid the groundwork for what we're doing today. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members, and thank you for those very kind words, uh, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is David Parks, uh, P-A-R-K-S. Uh, I'm here today with Silver State Equality. I'd like to uh, thank Senator Orenshaw for bringing this for bill forward. Uh, please record my strong support for Senate Bill uh, 302. I won't repeat what you've already heard uh, from other uh, uh, speakers. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, for the privilege of uh, the time to make these words. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your service to this, <clears throat> to this body. Thank you. We'll come back up here to uh, Carson City. Yes, ma'am. Good, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Danny Dawson from Las Vegas, Nevada. My preferred pronouns are she and her. I'm here representing HRC Nevada. I am in support of SB 302. 
I'm a volunteer counselor for one of the largest nationwide 501c organizations who supports LGBTQIA persons with suicidal ideations. I see firsthand how not having gender-affirming care has an adverse effect on the well-being of our community. Those medical personnel that provide this life-saving care should feel safe to do so wherever they practice. Some states have passed legislation based off hate, fear, and disinformation. This is our opportunity to enact legislation based on love, compassion, and standards of care based on statistical data. It is our civic responsibility to protect those who protect us. I am grateful for your time and consideration. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Del Rio Perkins. I am non-binary. I am representative of Gender Justice Nevada. I am here in support of Bill SB 302. The reason why I'm here in support is because when I think of this bill, it doesn't just cover the ability to not criminalize someone who is rooting for the gender of non-binary and gender uh, neutral community, but what it is is creating opportunity for people to live an affirming life, people that look like me, people that walk like me, people that is your brothers, your sisters, your daughters, your children, and many people in this room right here today. What you do and what you have done has created the opportunity for people to be able to not just exist, but to thrive. And to continuously do so is a duty in which you all have taken an honor to sit on this chair for. And I love that we are sitting in this room today with the opportunity to push that narrative forward. Thank you so much. And I appreciate y'all already. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Frankie Perez, F-R-A-N-K-I-E. Um, my zip code is 89117. Um, I am the LGBTQ justice organizer with Make the Road Nevada. It's a nonprofit org that really builds um, people power uh, in working class and communities of color. I'm here in support of SB 302 as a community organizer, a United States Air Force veteran, and a father. When I returned from my last deployment in Djibouti, Africa, I knew that receiving gender affirming care was the next steps for me. And finding a provider that I felt safe and affirmed with was crucial for my well being. As a father of five adopted children, I can't imagine the difficulties that parents have to face uh, to that live in states that do not support gender affirming care have to make to come here to receive that kind of care that they need. SB 302 would allow healthcare providers to provide gender affirming care without disqualifying or disciplining them for providing the services that have made it possible for me to thrive. I ask you to support SB 302 and thank you for your time. Thanks, Frankie, and thank you for your service. Hello, uh, my name is Marshall Dahlbeck. Um, I'll be 26 this month. I grew up in Dayton, so just over the hill here. Uh, and I am testifying in support of uh, Senate Bill 302 today. Um, this year marks uh, 10 years after my first suicide attempt at 16, which manifested um, due to experiencing uh, domestic violence and uh, insecure housing and income um, at home, and then uh, repeated attempts um, as an adult as well. Um, and today marks four weeks into my recovery from top surgery, so yay me. Um, and basically it took me like six years to um, get to this point because of relapses in um, insurance, and then at the time of um, September 2018, I couldn't find a single top surgeon in the state of Nevada that accepted um, insurance um, that I had. So I moved to Washington for a year and moved back and then um, still couldn't find one um, aside from one in Las Vegas. And uh, he was really disrespectful, um, just didn't really see me for me or for the person that I was in his office to try and become. So I did have to go out of state. Um, Basically, all I'm going to say is that uh, cisgender people um, get gender-affirming care all the time. Um, they get boob jobs. They get, uh, like, enhancements, all sorts of things. So it is um, very much on the basis of identity that um, we are being discriminated against because lawsuits um, for, like, boob jobs 
and things like that. Um, you know, it's pretty much a non-issue, but that's because cisgender people are trusted in knowing who they are more than we are. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say as you go back to your seat, uh, for those of you who are not aware, <clears throat> in Nevada, every um, medical facility uh, is required to have cultural competency training and cultural competency training just for that reason. And I will say if anyone has, ex has an experience like that, uh, I would encourage you to report that person or those persons to their uh, governing board. Okay, thank you. Great godly morning, everybody, uh, Madam Chair and committee. Uh, my name is Reverend Lee Arne, that's spelled L-I, last name A-R-N-E-E. -E. I am with Unity Fellowship of Christ Church Movement, Las Vegas. I'm here today because my life began in 20, 2011. Um, at the age of 45, that's when I, that's when I began dr thriving on um, when I was able to begin my uh, gender affirming situations. Uh, before then, I attempted to self-remove my breast. Um, before then, I, I, just, I just wasn't able to thrive in life. I feel that in, uh, in high school, had I been able to uh, have my gender affirming operations then, had I been able to identify as the handsome man that I am today, had I been able to um, just be me uh, back in 1982, I'm not telling my age. However, um, I think that I would, life would have been totally different and I would have thrived and uh, achieved more in life as uh, the person that God had intended me to be. So thank you very much, Anashe. I'm short and I can barely reach that microphone button. Hi, my name is LaToya Holman. Um, I live in Las Vegas. I've been in Las Vegas for 25 years, it's my home. It's been my pleasure to support many of you that I see here. Madam Chair, it's an honor. Um, Senator Scheibel, it's an honor. Um, these stories are upsetting. Um, sorry. I, uh, I'm here as an ally. I'm a, a black woman um, and I'm a straight girl. Uh, cisgender, heterosexual, um, but I'm straight. That's usually what my friends say. Um, I believe in family, and I believe in a parent's right to take care of their child. I'm assuming everyone looking back at me right now or not looking at me feels the same. Um, I'm here in allyship of this community because some of the stories that you have heard today as disturbing and upsetting as they are, um, lifelong harmful experiences will happen um, to our children if we don't let parents take care of them. If, they don't, if we do not allow parents to work with doctors, I mean, all of this documentation tells you, uh, you know, it would allow healthcare providers to practice in the state without fear. Um, this doc documentation tells you that every major medical, you know, association understands that this care is, is absolutely necessary. It's monitored. Um, if we don't do this, it's going to be inevitable that our kids end up with these kinds of stories. So um, in allyship, as the straight girl in the room, I, I will tell you, I know what it feels like. My parents knew what it felt like to not have community stand with them. And I am not that person. Just because I am not trans does not mean I don't stand with this community. I will always stand with the LGBTQ plus community, particularly when it comes to families, protecting their children and having the right to make decisions about their health care. I ask that you support this bill. Thank you. 
Good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. Leah Case, L-E-A-C-A-S-E, -E, here today on behalf of the Nevada Psychiatric Association. Our physicians are the providers, uh, part of the provider groups that would be impacted by this bill, and we are thrilled to be in full support of SB 302. I also want to let you know, in case my colleague doesn't make it up to the table in the time limit, that the Nevada Primary Care Association, the um, federally qualified health centers throughout the state, are also in support of this bill. Thank you. Good morning, committee. Just in time, J-U-S-T-I-N-T-Y-M-E. First, I would like to thank you for considering even hearing SB 302. And as a trans man who is pre-everything medically, I feel very grateful to live in Nevada, where I feel safe in moving forward in my decision to live who as I've always been. My concern is for my fellow siblings who live in states where this is not acceptable where they can be harmed, their providers be arrested. It's for their safety and for them to be able to come here and receive that treatment they need to save their lives, to live authentically as who they identify as. I implore with great passion that SB 302 be supported and passed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and we have about a minute left for support, um, and we'll come back around um, if we get a chance after uh, the other. So about a minute, about a minute left, less than a minute. Good morning, y'all. My name's Anastasia Tarver. Um, I'm a member of the, commu of the community, a transgender woman, and so why, I don't really understand is uh, why this is even like brought bring up to a law since uh, like uh, this would protect providers and doctors for doing their job, and this uh, like like uh, life saving uh, treatment is life saving. So at the end of the day, if you don't support this or if you're not in support of it, it's uh, you're essentially endangering other people's lives. Thank you. Oh, less than a minute. Tori Shack, T O R R I S Shack, S H A C K, representing our Santa Reno. Um, just wanted to let you know I am a two time attempted suicide sur survivor and was because of my gender dysphoria when I was started at 10 years old. I was sent home from school because I had no top on. I thought I was a boy. And um, I was also discriminated against harshly by my father. I was not, he did not want a paper trail at all of any of my medical. Um, you know, going to ther therapy because of me being gay. Um, I am a trans man. Um, I just had top surgery in July. And I applaud, uh, I'm also a transplant from California. You could not pay me to go back to California. I love Nevada, but uh, just wanted to support, uh, show my support for SB um, 302, thank you. Okay, last, unfortunately, sir, we're gonna have to make her the last one and we'll come back around if we get a chance, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, Turn, turn the microphone on. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Cherokee Hines, and I just want to say that I am in support of this bill because I am grateful that I am able to access gender-affirming care. Because if anything, and it's allowed me to put my best face forward, and, I'm, and if anything, I'm glad that it's here because I'm actually able to show myself to the world and everybody to see who I am versus who I wasn't or who I was told to be. And I'm worried about that care being taken away if this bill doesn't pass because I worry about my friends that are in states that are not safe. I, if anything, I had a phone call last night before this where a friend of mine was letting me know that a friend of mine is in a state that's considering moving. And the first thing out of my mouth was, hey, come to Nevada. They have care here. And if this bill passes, it would really be a problem to have me say, hey, we don't come here because that bill hasn't passed, so there's no care here. I also have another friend who actually has a, uh, a child that actually is trans. And if things get hairy, I'm like, hey, come here. We have care here. We have doctors here. And this care is lifelong. And it would really, it would really bother me if I wasn't able to ac access the care, much less tell my friends to come here to get the care that they need so they can be themselves and thrive. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, and we'll come back around, but I need to get to the phones. Um, BPS, anyone on the phones who is in support? 
If you would like to testify in support of SB 302, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. My name is Erin Rook, E-R-I-N-R-O-O-K. I use he, him, and they, them pronouns, and I'm a proud resident of Senate District 3. Senate Bill 302 cannot be more timely. Just yesterday, the Idaho Governor, Brad Little, signed into bill, uh, signed a bill into law that makes it a felony to provide gender-affirming health care to people under 18, including hormone therapies. I just want to reiterate that in Idaho, our neighbor to the north, is a felony to provide a minor with medically appropriate and often life-saving care. Arizona, our neighbor to the south, has also passed laws to restrict access to gender-affirming care. As many have mentioned, we know that these are coming up across uh, the country, uh, criminalizing gender-affirming care for children and adults, uh, forcing folks to look outside of their home states for care and a decent quality of life. Uh, no parent or health care provider should be criminalized for providing that support. While some of those in opposition to this bill will try to convince you that the research doesn't support gender-affirming care, that couldn't be further from the truth. I know this because I've been reporting on and advocating for access to gender-affirming care for more than a decade. I'm also a transgender person who has had the benefit of accessing gender-affirming care and have seen how access to care positively transforms the lives of trans youth. According to research published by the American Academy of Pediatrics, 30 to 50 percent of trans youth report attempting suicide. By comparison, 10 to 18 percent of their cisgender peers report such attempts. And a 2021 study by the Journal of Adolescent Health shows that access to hormones reduced depression and suicidality among transgender youth. Lives are literally at stake, and gender affirming care is the solution. In a study, the authors wrote, quote, as our patients grow older, they have repeatedly told us that gender affirming care helped them survive adolescence and successfully transition into adulthood. They say early access to care allowed gender to simply be another aspect of identity, not the main focus. I'm proud to live in a state where my rights as a transgender person are protected. To fail to extend those same protections to people seeking medical refuge in our state would be hypocritical and frankly cruel. Regardless of your personal views regarding gender affirming care, I urge you to stand on the side of freedom and support. Thank you to the bill's many sponsors for your support of transgender people and our families and to all the parents out there fighting for their trans children. Thank you. Caller, go ahead. Good morning, um, Senator Spearman and members of the committee. My name is Bishop Bonnie Radden. I am not only a pastor and a bishop, but I'm also a psychologist. I came to Nevada in 2017 after the shooting as a mass crisis counselor. I saw some of the lack of services and started a nonprofit entitled The Gathering Place, which Senator Spearman mentioned earlier in my partnership with Rob from Huntridge Medical Clinic. I was also a proud individual of being a part of a group writing a document entitled Changing Your Gender in Nevada to help our trans brothers and sisters in those places. I would like everyone, if they can, to go to YouTube. And unfortunately, it was 14 years ago that Barbara Walters did a 2020 piece on trans children entitled My Secret Life. It not only changed my life as a gay woman, but I have used it over and over again with individuals who can't really understand our trans brothers and sisters, and particularly our trans children under five years old. I'm in strong support of SB 302. I also want to say that yesterday I was a part of a group of individuals talking about these bans across the United States. Dr. Ebony Winford of Tennessee shared with us the horrible things that have gone on since the bans have happened there and the horrible things around our trans brothers and sisters. I was proud because of the map they showed, showed a color green which said that Nevada had no ban or has protections for our trans patients. I just wanna thank you today for hearing me, particularly again, I would like for you to go and look at that YouTube 
video by Barbara Walters. It is incredibly powerful. And again, the Gathering Place provides services to our trans brothers and sisters currently at no charge. And um, I am very, very in support of SB 302. Thank you for your time. Good morning. Um, my name is Brooke Malath, and my comments are um, reflecting only my personal views and not for any organization. As you have heard, there are concerted efforts in jurisdictions outside of this state that are passing laws that criminalize the treatment of transgender people, children, and adults, their parents, and their providers, even those that are treated in states where it is legal such as Nevada. It is up to this body to take a stand against the overreach and cruel intent of those immoral and unjust laws. To those legislators who have supported such laws, I say clearly and on the record, if you have to make laws to hurt a group of people just to prove your morals and faith, then you have no true morals or faith to prove. In this time of performative cruelty by hateful people, it is imperative for this body to publicly support compassion and protect the most vulnerable amongst us. Protect these providers who treat not only transgender patients, but many others in need of primary and specialty care. Show the world that Nevada truly is a place where the principles of this country are true, that all people are created equal, have unalienable rights, including the rights to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness vote yes on sb302 and i yield my time okay uh thank you bps do we have anyone else in uh support because we need to go to opposition anyone else on the phones in support My name is Jenna Robertson, for the record, co-founder of Nevada Alliance for Student Diversity, and I'm a mom of five, including a fierce, outspoken transgender daughter who wishes she were with, their, uh, with you there in person today. I don't know what sexual dysphoria is, as stated by a previous senator today, but I'm the mother of a child with gender dysphoria. It has nothing to do with her sexuality. It has to do with how she feels, how she presents, how she dresses what she wants to be called, what pronouns she uses, and how she wants you to interact with her. It has to do with how she sees herself in the world and how she wants us to see her and treat her and speak to her. And I'm sure the senator misspoke today and knows that gender has nothing to do with sexuality, but it's a fear that many people who don't know any trans people have. So I wanted to correct that, and thank you for letting me do that. As a fan... <clears throat> I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, and you only, you only have yes, about 15 yes, seconds left. Thank you. It told me to unmute, and I thought I was unmuted. Have you heard any of my testimony yet? We have, but you only have about 15 seconds, so if you can wrap it up and whatever you don't get to say, you Thank can submit you. it by write, in writing. Four. As a family of a trans child, we have the gift and the privilege of time she revealed herself to us when she was eight years old, well before, before puberty. And we had the time to debate things like blockers and gender affirming care. And it was scary until I saw a set of identical twins assigned male at birth. One grew into a handsome strapping young man and the other was given the gift of puberty blockers and was able to develop into a gorgeous feminine young teen girl, identical twins. From Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse no me, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, can you submit yes. the rest of it in writing, yes. please? Okay. And a BPS, we're going to ask. Of my yeah. time today, Hello, ma'am. So Hello, ma'am. Yeah, can you submit the rest of your testimony in writing? We're out of time. I need to get to opposition uh, as well. So if you can either hang on or call back, we can finish it. But I'd encourage you to submit your, um, your testimony in writing, okay? Thank you so much. Uh, BPS, you. Uh, stand by. SB 302. Okay. BPS, stand by because we'll come back. Try to come back to um, uh, support 
but we got to go to opposition now. And opposition, uh, I think we've left, we've had about 25 minutes in support, so I want to give huh? 28 minutes in support, so I, want, I need to give opposition the same amount of time. Uh, and I'm just going to ask everyone, like I said in, in the beginning, if your testimony is like someone else's, it's okay to come up and say ditto because there may be people behind you that want to get their um, uh, support or uh, opposition um, on the record, okay? Uh, so anyone in opposition here in Carson City and in um, Las Vegas, and for those of you who don't know, our legislature only meets every other year for 120 days. Uh, if we had annual sessions, we would always have more time for bills like this. Unfortunately, we don't. Uh, and it is my prayer and my hope that one day, I won't be here, but one day the legislature will have annual sessions so that, so that issues such as this can receive the proper amount of time uh, for discussion. Okay? So we'll start here in uh, Carson City and then go to Las Vegas. Uh, I see one chair occupied. There's another chair that's vacant. So if you're in opposition, come to the table. Uh, in Las Vegas, there are two chairs vacant here in Carson City. And this is where we'll start. If you got two more people in opposition, please come and occupy these chairs. Yes, ma'am. Let's begin. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Janine Hansen. I'm the state president of Nevada Families for Freedom. And, of course, the things I say are going to be my own opinion. We oppose uh, Senate Bill 302. There is nothing stopping gender-affirming doctors from practicing in Nevada right now or moving here for that matter. This bill will make Nevada a sanctuary state for hacked doctors with little government opportunity to protect our citizens. We oppose limiting the powers of the governor and agencies to protect our citizens. We mourn for the children who will be permanently harmed by this legislation. In Nevada, we will now become a gender-affirming tourism state. Nevada law still requires consent for parental consent for gender affirming care. This was brought to my attention by Senator Scheibel, and I appreciate her for that. This bill does not change that, that uh, parental consent is still required. And so this bill does not uh, make any difference to that. We oppose this bill and encourage you to think of the future of our state. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Julie Burke, and I'm in opposition to SB 302. Uh, there seems to be a disturbing theme with several bills presented this session that involve children, and I have to wonder why the incredible desire to alter children's genders. In enticing doctors to come to uh, this state to perform these gender-affirming practices when they have broken the law elsewhere is wrong. How can one set such a low standard for a child's doctor? Where was the same passion and concern for the doctors who were trying to save lives with prophylactic drugs during COVID-19? That the attitude was quite the opposite, which proves a point. I believe this bill is agenda-driven. The movement to dismantle families and harm children has deep pockets and depraved minds. There are many statistics and stories regarding the severe and harmful effects of gender surgery on children. Nevada should not be a destination for this or protect those who choose to break the law to perform it. The movement to confuse children into this ideology is the real issue that should be addressed. This, I don't believe this is loving or caring. Please vote no. We'll go now to uh, Las Vegas, and if there's anyone else here in Carson City in opposition, please come to the table now. Las Vegas. Good morning, Madam Chair, fellow members of the committee. Thank you so much for the work that you people do. I really appreciate you. I'd like to bring another perspective to this whole issue. I've been hearing all morning about gender affirmation. But the whole argument has been to support transgender efforts. And the reason why I oppose the bill is the bill is not inclusive. We're not affirming people or counseling that would help people to overcome these kinds of problems. They are largely 
psychological, probably spiritual. We need a bill that includes that kind of therapy, that kind of health care. This does not include that. And I share uh, Ms. Hansen's comment about uh, uh, restricting the governor's uh, authority to extradite when other uh, states um, calls for that, which in my opinion is unconstitutional. I have a brother, I had a brother, he died at 60. He was homosexual, he died of oral cancer. One month ago I celebrated, we celebrated my grandson's 23rd birthday. He introduced us to his boyfriend. It breaks my heart. I love him. I loved my brother. But they didn't get, he didn't get the, in my opinion, the health care, the emotional, moral, spiritual health care that he needed. Thank I'm you, sir. everything I can thank, to thank, provide the moral, yeah. spiritual thank, sir, health care thank to you. my grandson. Thank you. Needs. Your, your time thank is you. up. Please submit the rest of your testimony and, and write. Oh, and we need your name, too. We need your name, sir. Before you leave the table, can you uh, give us your name? C.T. Wong, W-A-N-G. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, committee members, and fellow Nevadans. I oppose SB 302 for many reasons. Excuse me, my name is Leslie Quinn, for the record. I oppose SB 302 for many reasons, but my message today isn't about those reasons. As a parent, I will always want to get medical care for my children so they can thrive in this world as a whole person. I also hope this for all parents and all peoples. Today my message is to all struggling with gender dysphoria or any mental health issue. No, you are fearfully and wonderfully made just the way you are. No, you are loved from head to toe just the way you are. No, there are many that will support you just the way you are. You were not born a mistake. No, you are loved by the God of all creation so much that he sent his only son to die on the cross for you. I encourage everyone to love our fellow humans. Please do not encourage vengeance vengeance or retribution against others that don't agree with you. Choice is a freedom we are all given by God. Please oppose SB 302. Thank you. Hello, my name is Susan Prophet, and I am the Vice President of Nevada Republican Club, but today I am speaking for myself because I have some experience with this. <clears throat> um, and thank you for trying to help people because this is an issue, and uh, it's getting larger every day, and I, I have my ideas on why, but I, we don't have time for that. I oppose SB 302, uh, transgender care, especially for children, um, because uh, Nevada lacks the medical infrastructure to s service the citizens, and adding this bill before you address current issues um, is, and expenses, is um, it, it could implode the state. Seriously, we don't have the infrastructure. And there's a lot of things that have to happen before we're going to be able to attract the doctors to move here. Um, and there's been some misinformation shared here. Um, we do not get the insurance companies to pay for our boob jobs. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about you all, but um, when I needed a breast reduction because I was a size H, I was refused uh, to, by the insurance companies, but I had to have it because it was causing other issues. And um, so I paid for it. And, and it was really insulting when Nevada charged me a luxury t uh, tax on top of that just to um, help myself uh, medically. Um, and um, I really don't want to pay for somebody else's you know, transgender changings, because this is a choice, okay? When I moved here, um, Silver State assigned me to a pediatrician, be and I'm a senior citizen with disabilities, and we do not have the infrastructure. I can't, I can't express that more, more strongly enough. I mean, you really need to get that fixed before you go any further. Um, and um, 
I would suggest that you make sure that they have this, the um, emotional support, the psychiatric care in the cases that need it, and, um, and, and, and allow people to make choices on how they want to live without um, passing judgment. I do believe that. Um, but, um, and, I, and I have to say, when I hear some of the other stories, um, the fact that parents are being denied the ability to make the parental decisions regarding medical and school issues appears to reinforce the suspicions that many have. Um, and, and I don't want to believe it, but it, it does appear that you want to remove the parents' rights, and that's unconstitutional. Thank so, you, ma'am. Can you that's submit all the I rest? Have to say, Thank and you. I hope that you will Thank not pass this bill. Thank you. Anyone else here in Las Vegas? Anyone, I mean, Las Vegas, anyone here in Carson City? BPS, anyone on the phones? And I'm going to ask once again if everyone who's testifying, please, 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 two minutes. We have two more bills to hear today, and I'd like to get to them today. Um, so I don't see anyone here. BPS, anyone on the phones? If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 302, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chairwoman, Chairman. My name is Wiz Rosard. That is spelled W-I-Z-R-O-U-Z-A-R-D. I am calling in my own personal capacity and expressing my opinion. In regards to this bill, great intent, but the only reason I'm opposing it is because it doesn't go far enough. We saw during COVID, when we talk about the scope of the bill protecting healthcare providers, we saw during COVID that many states, including California, sought to restrict the ability for doctors to truly exercise <clears throat> their oath in providing care through a voluntary service with their patients. If this bill is about protecting patients and doctors being able to make decisions consensually that is best for them in providing the treatment, then I would encourage the bill sponsor to include in Section 1, 4, 2, along with 3, not only gender-affirming services, but services such as a patient who refuses to want a COVID vaccine or any vaccine. We saw healthcare providers deny the ability to exercise their profession at certain institutions due to the fact that they were exercising their oath and their ability to provide the care that their patient wanted. So I would ask that not only would the bill sponsor propose this amendment, but that this body also accepts that conceptual amendment and pass it and ensuring that when it comes to the state of Nevada, what this bill is intending to do is to protect all health care providers who seek to simply exercise their oath and not be persecuted for doing so between their patients, even if that includes a parent who would like to provide treatment to their child. And therefore, if this proposal were to be accepted in a minute as a Nevadan, as the person who loves freedom and liberty, and in the spirit of the Constitution and American values stated earlier for our pursuit of happiness, I would definitely be happy to support that bill. But in this time, I ask you to oppose, and hopefully we can get a consensual amendment that protects all health care providers and, more importantly, protect the patient and doctor relationship in this great state of Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, BPS. Anyone else? We are in opposition. Uh, good morning, Bob Russo for the record. I oppose Senate Bill 302 because it will make Nevada a safe haven for criminal doctors who come here to perform gender-affirming treatments and are seeking protection from prosecution in other states. It will prevent the governor from ex ex extraditing doctors who have broken gender-affirming laws in other states. I believe that the larger picture behind this and similar bills is the concerted effort to push gender-affirming surgery and the use of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones on our youth. In my opinion, this is not only immoral, but dangerous to the health and well-being of our young people. 
According to California endocrinologist Michael Laidlaw, cross-sex hormones carry side effects, including sterility and increased risk for breast and uterine cancers, plus harmful psychoactive effects such as mood swings and psychosis. Ryan T. Anderson, in a March 9, 2018 article with the Heritage Foundation, cites a 30-year Swedish study that showed that 10 to 15 years after surgical reassignment, the suicide rate of those that had undergone sex reassignment surgery rose to 20 times that of comparable peers. As Senator Stone implied, kids can outgrow their gender dysphoria. Therefore, I'm in the camp that believes that gender affirm affirmative procedures should be reserved for those capable of making a clear decision as to whether they want it, a minimum of 21 years of age. It also appears that the push for gender affirming care is about money, big money for the medical and pharma industries. According to the recently released documentary entitled Affirmation Generation, the U.S. sex reassignment surgery market revenue income was $304.8 million in 2020, with estimates of it reaching $781.8 million by 2027. In my opinion, this movement is sacrificing our use at the altar of government dependency, big thank you, sir. and the medical industries. Sir, excuse me, sir. Sir, yes. thank, thank you so much for your testimony. You have quoted thank several. You. You've quoted several art, uh, articles, and um, I'd appreciate it if you could either send the names uh, of the people that you quoted or the link so that we can include that. Um, and let's try to get it in you by bet. tomorrow. I can, I can. I'll be up there today. I can. I can turn this in if you'd like. Well, send send it electronically, and the authors that you quoted will need that too uh, in order to, in order to include that in the in the record. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, BPS, anyone else? Mrs. Chair, uh, thank you for running this meeting so well today. And uh, to the Senate committee, um, my fellow believers, uh, my LGBTQ friends, and also happy Passover to the Jewish community. God loves you. Each one of you are beautifully created. And there are members of the opposite sex who would desire you. Folks, as a state, we must get rid of the stigma of being called Sin City. I like this slogan from Dr. Fauci when he said, follow the science. In Cicero's words, True law is right reason in agreement with nature. In his opinion, nature is the highest manifestation of right reason. It's at universal application, unchanging and everlasting. It sums up to duty by its command and overts from wrongdoing by its prohibition. Most importantly, this bill is unconstitutional according to how it can stop reproducing human life and could condemn a, ch a child. It could condemn a person to a choice made in their childhood. In Las Vegas, we are lacking in education. Legislators, please show our state the importance of scientific facts and reason. Also, we're uh, underpopulated. And uh, I was raised in the home of a real African woman. And I will always advocate for the African American community. We must ensure that this community will continue to grow. SB 302 discourages the reproduction of that community. And also, I'd like to ditto the two women, Ms. Leslie and uh, Ms. Susan. And I'm also against this, our tax dollars being used for this. Um, but I hope you guys have a good day. But please. Uh, Thank you, sir. Please submit the rest of your testimony in writing. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, BPS, we have additional callers, and um, I'm going to really ask everyone to please stick to the two minutes, and if someone has already said what you want to say, it's okay to say ditto, okay? BPS, additional callers? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
We hear you. Hello. Hello. Caller, continue. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning. My name is Norma Valley. I'm the Community Relations Chair for Boulder City Republican Women, and I'm speaking on my own behalf. Let me preface this by saying I have deep compassion for anyone, especially children going through psychological difficulties. Let me also preface by saying not all lesbians and gays support the trans movement, and it is indeed a movement. I oppose SB 302 that will serve as a dangerous means to foster the aggressive move to indoctrinate our children and parents into believing that the solution to any child's psychological ill will be solved by changing their gender. Without question, children who express any confusion about gender are encouraged to start puberty blockers and all medical steps to begin uh, re gender reassignment. Many of these medical trans facilities automatically start the process simply on a child saying so. These high rates of suicide in trans children is tragic, but it is erroneous to conclude that one is the cause of the other. The rise in depression and anxiety in our children is symptomatic of far greater issues in our society. What we need to do is to get to the root of their depression and bring legislation to support help, not enact legislation like SB 302 that accelerates this surge in transgenderism. Children are fragile and malleable. Their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until age 25. Why is LGBTQ plus not speaking about their brothers and sisters detransitioning, living in deep pain and regret, mutilated and angry that they were not better guided. As a child, I considered myself a tomboy. I am so grateful. My parents didn't take me to a transgender medical facility to fix me. We should oppose SB 302 that supports radical and permanent biological changes to children for a psychological state that is so often a temporary condition. Thank you. Morning. This is Lynn Chapman, uh, Independent American Party. Um, these are my words. Uh, we understand uh, when people are 18 years or older, that's their business, whatever they do. And we understand that children are not included in uh, the surgeries and meds because they need their parents' consent concerning this bill. We know we need more doctors to come to Nevada, but we believe we need to be very careful of what doctors we allow to come to our state and practice medicine. Doctors who perform surgeries in another state that doesn't allow the surgery and that state files criminal charges against that doctor, that doctor should not be able to come to our state and be protected. Also concerning is SB 302 uh, prohibits any state agency in the executive branch from providing information, time, money, facilities, property, equipment, and resources of the state in the furtherance of an investigation initiated in or by another state. In other words, any state agency in the executive, uh, executive branch is not allowed to do their job. And that isn't what the taxpayers paid for or expect from our government. Please vote no on SB 302. Thank you. My name is Celeste Parks. I oppose SB 302. I am a Christian and also a healthcare worker in Nevada. This bill protects physicians that have been disciplined by their state medical board, which is very alarming as a nurse. And according to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, adolescents are less likely to think before they act, pause to consider the consequences of their action, and also are less likely to change their dangerous or inappropriate behaviors. This is very much because of the, uh, the frontal cortex, the area of the brain that controls reasoning and helps us think before we act develops later. This part of the brain is still changing and maturing well into adulthood. As a healthcare worker, I'm a firm believer in mental health, and I say present a bill that would support mental health, just like my fellow um, person that went before me. Um, and I say that there was a French study um, that presented there are many post-operative complications of male to female surgery reassignment 
excuse me, sex reassignment surgery. Um, so do we really want our developing children to go through these very complicated um, post-surgical com- complications? This is very life-threatening. Um, also, too, I do want to um, say that there is also a scripture in the Bible, um, Genesis 127. So God created a man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created and he, them. So um, that to please oppose SB 302. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good we morning. Can, we can hear you. Um, dear Senator. Okay, great. Thank you. Michelle Hall, for the record, I'm speaking in my personal capacity, my opinion only. Um, I respectfully wish to go on the record and implore you all to vote no on SB 302. Um, I quickly also chime in, ditto, that God, your creator, loves each and every one of you, everyone in that room, no matter your age, color, gender, race, religion, whatever. He loves everyone. And so this is not a message of hate or intolerance or unacceptance. Okay, it's opposite to that. It's a message of care, concern, um, and engagement. So I, too, am not sure why none of the activists today gave testimony on all the folks who are detransitioning. We know that many young people regret their gender change treatments and surgeries. If you just simply scroll the Internet, you will find many, many very sad testimonies that are coming to light in increasing numbers. These reports mostly seem to be people under the age of 25. Um, you know, hearkening back to the previous caller about frontal cortex development that we're, you know, we're not really mature until around that age. And so allowing kids to, to undergo these incredibly serious changes in their body um, before they're mature is, is radical. It's radical. And, you know, if you look at Reddit, YouTube, TikTok, you'll see these testimonies, right? So if we don't allow people to drink legally until they're 21, how can we allow children to to have their bodies altered and their anatomy lobbed off, right? So if we think deeper about this, um, we know, we can see that there's a huge monetary advantage to the medical establishment. They are making a lot of money. Um, Gender dysphoria, we also know that that is something that has a time uh, element to it. It's a phase that most children um, get over, right? I'm going to say that Dr. Paul R. R. McHugh of John Hopkins University noted a Vanderbilt University study um, and also London's Portman Clinic of Children. Thank you, ma'am. He, Can you please um, submit the rest of your testimony in writing? What? Thank you. Submit your rest, rest of your t- testimony oh, in writing. Can. Thank okay. You so much. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. I'd like to ditto the comments made by the previous callers. First, I'd like to point out that I don't see this as a public health issue because, and this along with the so-called doctor shortage, because the same people who were trying to help public health were promoting the lockdowns and the vaccines, and yet we have not get any reports on whether they work. Uh, it was not too long ago, I, I believe it was almost 20 years ago, that the idea of children changing their genders was considered a taboo when I would watch television shows on Oprah. And we weren't really talking about this 5 to 15 years ago. What changed? Let's just think about it. All I see this is as, as a war against heterosexuality, a war against uh, promoting a good-sized birth rate, to replace the population, the family, and I fear this is nothing more to be used as political pawns for agendas. So other than that, I will yield my time. Thank you very much for bringing up this issue. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Lisa Parti, spelled P as in Paul, A R T as in Tom, E E. Uh, nowhere have I heard that the people seeking gender affirming services are being rejected because it's illegal. There's a doctor who testified that's practicing these services, so it's not illegal. It seems to me that this is a bill, a solution looking for a problem. None of the fine folks testifying today as to their journeys address the issues as to what this bill truly addresses. It doesn't ensure the safety of anyone nor is anyone in danger if it doesn't pass. You're able to access these services. No one's denying those to you. I personally don't see or judge people of color or sexuality. Many of them today got the treatment they so sought eventually as adults the way it should be. Children are not developed enough in their brains to make these life-changing decisions. And I personally feel that any gender-affirming care should be required to be disallowed until they're at least 18 years old. There's nothing preventing parents from caring and nurturing their kids until they're old enough to make these decisions for themselves. That's parenting. I've also seen a few stories recently of adults whose parents provided gender transition for their kids who now have great regrets. This is something you can't get back, and I feel many parents are just trying to get the girl they've always wanted at the expense of the boy that they had. I could be wrong. The people who were adversely affected discussed how the mental health issues were never addressed. They only focused on the gender dysphoria and never solved the root problem. The depression never stopped with the surgeries. The suicides will continue. I fear all this gender dysphoria discussion this session will increase these incidents in Nevada. Please don't make Nevada a sanctuary state for gender affirming doctors from other states who have violated the laws of other states. I oppose restricting the governor's constitutional authority to extradite criminals who have fled to our state. This bill is unnecessary, overreaching, and by taking the rights of the governor to do what he may need to do. You're not looking out for Nevada citizens if you put this bill through. You need to remember your constituents who put you in office so as not to risk harm to our citizens. Thank you. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. So we'll go to the phones on neutral. And if there's anyone here in Carson City or in Las Vegas wants to testify neutral, uh, please come to the tables. BPS, we'll start with you. Anyone testifying neutral? If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 302, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Okay, uh, neutral here in Carson City. Don't see any. None in Las Vegas. So we had two more people that I promised we'd come back around for um, support. Okay, those two that were at the table when we had to leave. Hello, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Vanessa Dunn, V-A-N-E-S-S-A-D-U-N-N, on behalf of the Nevada Primary Care Association, representing the federally qualified health centers in the state. Our clinics are the safety net for providers, those who are for those who are uninsured and uninsured, as well as providing safe, non-judgmental care to all who seek care. SB 302 would directly impact the, the providers at FQHCs and NVPCA is in support. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, co committee members. My name is Sakura Nishikawa. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a, also a Japanese trans woman. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. My zip code is 89118. I am a volunteer with the Human Rights Campaign, and we are here today with the Equal Nevada Equal Coalition. I support 30, SB 302, which will help our LGBT communities by allowing parents to, of transgender and non-binary ch children to make decisions without government inter intervention. Please support the bill that will help us community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we'll close out the testimony and invite uh, Senator Orenshaw. And as you come, I just wanted to uh, add to the record um, 
a couple of items. Um, I think someone mentioned in um, one of the segments that uh, gender dysphoria is um, a mental disorder. And the manual, the diagnostic manual of mental disorders removed homosexuality in 1973. So it's not a mental disorder. And also another um, verse from the Library of Medicine and it states in terms of gender dysphoria that it is uh, a neuroanatomical link, uh, something that is in the brain, and so it's not something that's in people's minds. Okay, just wanted to put that on the record because I think science is important, and I'm, a, I'm not allergic to it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Chair Spearman, members of the committee, James Orenshaw, State Senate District 21, thank you for your time and attention to Senate Bill 302 today. This legislation seeks to protect healthcare providers and individuals in Nevada who are involved in gender affirming services in other states. If Senate Bill 02 is enacted, we can ensure access to essential health care for our transgender and non-binary non brothers and sisters and provide a safe environment for health care providers to offer these necessary services. I believe it's our responsibility as legislators and citizens to support and protect the well-being of all members of our community. And I believe that Senate Bill 302 is an important step towards achieving that goal. Uh, Chair, with your indulgence, could Rob and Andre make some brief closing comments? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Andre Wade, Silver State Equality for the record. I uh, quickly just wanted to uh, course correct some of the conversations that were being had um, with youth and transitioning. Um, it's often social affirmation and puberty blockers that which are reversible and rarely does it um, involve um, surgeries. And so I just wanna make sure that we are clear on, on that for the record. Um, lastly, um, Gender affirming care is very much inclusive of um, mental health services and uh, um, counseling. And so SB 163, which we've talked about in this session, and SB 302, um, Chapter 630, protects counseling and mental health services. Um, and also, also um, SB 302 protects parental rights and consent. So I uh, just want to clarify that. And lastly, um, if there are any sort of unlawful, bad malpractice going on in other states, if someone comes to this state, um, then that is still going to be considered bad practice and malpractice uh, and bad treatment. And so it's, this is not a bill that would allow uh, people who are uh, providing bad care to then provide bad care here. So I just want to clarify that for the record. Thank you. John Phoenix for the records. What are the public testimony providers um, stated about cisgendered individuals being allowed and provided gender affirming care? And we actually have legislative protections under Title 10 that allows children as young as 13 to access gender affirming care in the form of birth control without regard to their parental consent. Detransitioning is extremely uncommon. Gender GP publishes on their website data from five countries and the very low rates of detransition. In the United States, they rep represents about 8% of those individuals who engage in any gender affirming services, but they also highlight that 62% of those people who do experience detransition are doing so because of the, peer, the pressures of their peers, their families, and social pressures. So while it is something that does happen, it is extremely uncommon, and in my 10 plus years of doing this, I have two patients who've detransitioned out of the over thousands that I've done, um, helped with their transition. So. Thank you for allowing me to clarify. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Appreciate your time. Uh, thank you. I think uh, Senator Scheibel has a question or a comment. Um, I, I do, and I just I want to thank you all again for your presentation. And I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I wanted to let the committee and everybody here know that on Monday, the North Dakota Senate did pass um, their ban on gender affirming care. And more concerningly, uh, just yesterday, the Idaho governor signed into law a uh, a bill banning gender affirming care um, in our neighboring state to the north. So I think that this uh, measure is extremely timely. I'm very heartened to see so many people here supporting it. And um, thank you again. Thank you, Senator Scheibel. Thank you, Chair Spearman. Appreciate all the members' attention. Hope you'll consider moving Senate Bill 302. Thank you. And with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 302. We are awaiting the arrival of the Majority Leader, and we'll get started. Uh, on her bill, Senate Bill 290. We'll be we'll be in a brief recess. Brief recess.
Okay, the Committee on Commerce and Labor is back in um, order. So uh, we will begin now. Uh, welcome the Majority Leader. Uh, we will be open the hearing now for Senate Bill 290. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee, and thank you for being accommodating um, as we're moving through to this next deadline. I know I had sort of asked to um, be able to present this bill. I, I do have another engagement that I have to get to shortly, so I do appreciate the committee's flexibility and apologize to anyone who you may have bumped out of the way, um, but I'm, I'm very grateful for that accommodation. Um, Good morning, and again, for the record, my name is Nicole Canazaro. I represent Senate District 6 in the northwest portion of the Las Vegas Valley, and I am here today to present to you Senate Bill 290, which seeks to license and regulate earned wage access service providers in the great state of Nevada. During the 81st legislative session, some of you may remember some of this conversation, as I know folks on this committee also served in the last session. Um, I had sponsored in that session Senate Bill 198, which was a similar measure that was amended and passed out of this committee that session, but did not eventually make it, unfortunately, to the finish line. One of the reasons that this particular conversation is, is pertinent today is because it does relate directly to so many of our communities and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here to present Senate Bill 290 which does have some changes from what we discussed last session um, and I'm hopeful that we will be able to get over the finish line this time around. Um, and chair and members of the committee, I know that it's no secret to anyone here that there are many families in our communities that struggle financially. And we often discuss that as a legislative body and with our constituents. Many Nevadans live paycheck to paycheck. Um, that is a very common occurrence. Unfortunately, in 2022, 64% of Americans were living paycheck to paycheck, which is up 11 percentage points from 2021, according to a recent Lending Club Bank report. In addition, 47% of those earning more than $100,000 per year reported living paycheck to paycheck. Think about that. That's a 13 percentage point increase from a low of 34% in July of 2021. 74% of Americans would experience financial difficulty if paychecks were delayed by a week. And that is a situation that so many of our folks are living under. For Nevadans that live on a tight budget, everyday events are not always compatible with pay periods. In this modern age, workers are demanding access to their already earned wages so that they can address those ongoing everyday needs. As so many of you have also heard me talk about, I grew up in a family where we lived paycheck to paycheck, and I've spent most of my life living paycheck to paycheck. It is not as uncommon as you would think. And for my family, things that would be an emergency expenditure or something that was outside of a regular calculated budget, budgetary item would mean a huge financial decision had to be made about what was going to be missed in lieu of that. How do you address that issue? Even small ones, even something like $200 could derail a family that's living paycheck to paycheck. In that situation, those small life events can be devastating. And sometimes it really is a matter of trying to find someone, asking your folks, asking your friends for just a little bit of money to put in your bank account just so you don't bounce checks. Um, and I have been there. I worked in the, in the restaurant industry um, as a busser, as a hostess, as a prep cook, washing dishes, as a server. Um, sometimes when you're waiting for that paycheck or you're waiting for the next day that you can go to work and make tips, you might just need like five dollars to put in your bank account just to make sure that nothing bounces so you don't get that $35 fee just to make sure you can make their bills and so when you're looking for that extra change in your sofa those are the kinds of things that we know everyday Nevadans are facing and as you may know earned wage access providers provide workers with an opportunity to access their net pay that they have already earned to date before the traditional payday, helping them to address financial emergencies or unexpected expenses. These services can be beneficial to many Nevadans, especially in times of economic uncertainty. However, it is crucial that we ensure these services are provided responsibly and transparently to protect both workers and businesses from potential exploitation. Earned wage access services began with the development of the gig economy, but this interest has spread to employers and employees in traditional businesses. The COVID-19 pandemic accelerated the demand of earned wage access at traditional brick and mortar businesses. For example, one in six grocery workers now have access to earned wage access services. 
While earned wage access may pay may offer benefits to both employers and employees, there are consumer protections that we absolutely must consider. And I know that this committee is, is no stranger to the idea of consumer protections. In Nevada, we lead on consumer protection, and that should be no different for earned wage access providers. One of the, our most important roles as legislators is to protect consumers from unscrupulous and dangerous products and services. We have a long and very thoughtful history of balanced regulation in Nevada, and especially within the financial realm, and that should continue with these applications, and that is why you are seeing before you Senate Bill 290. This legislation leads the nation in regulating a new and promising market alternative that has the power to bring much needed relief to hardworking Nevadans, particularly in these difficult times of record high inflation, inflation as families are struggling and banks are closing. We need to find safe, safe and secure means for Nevada families to avoid predatory credit finance. Um, Earned wage access really does allow for a worker who's in that position of, I just need a bit of money so I can get through this period. I need something to help me cover those. And it's all money. I think then the important part here is it's all money that they've already earned as a worker. They're just waiting for that payday. And if you talk to anybody who has ever lived paycheck to paycheck, that's really that critical space is when you're waiting for payday. Um, and so this is an effort to regulate that, provide some consumer protections. Um, you should have, members of the committee, a conceptual amendment that has been submitted that revises the original draft of Senate Bill 290, which was intro originally introduced. And that amendment is the product and result of very lengthy negotiations between the Earned Wage Access Industry, the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada, and the Nevada Financial Institutions Division. With your, with your permission, Chair, <coughs> Excuse me. I will provide the committee with a summary of the substantive sections, and we'll be working from that conceptual amendment um, because that is where we have been able to negotiate through some of the language. Sections 2 through 15 of the bill defines clear key terms and concepts that are essential to understanding earned, earned wage access services and that distinguish earned wage access services from other types of financial products. Section 5 defines earned but unpaid income to mean salary, wages, or other compensation that an employee has already earned but that has not been paid to the employee at the time of an EWA transaction or earned wage, earned wage access, which I am going to trip over, so we'll use EWA. This definition is key to distinguishing EWA products from loans and other lending-related financial products and services. Section 11 defines licensee and makes clear that an EWA provider must obtain a license to transact business in Nevada, whether as a direct-to-consumer or an employer-integrated EWA provider. To guarantee the responsible and transparent operation of these providers, Section 16 requires a provider to obtain a license from the Commissioner of the Division of Financial Institutions within the Department of Business and Industry. Section 16 through 17 detail the requirements for licensure, ensuring that only qualified and trustworthy businesses can offer these services. The commissioner is required to develop an application for licensing and establish a fee for the issuance and renewal of a license as an earned wage access provider. To be licensed, an applicant must disclose to FIB the terms and conditions that will govern its EWA products and services and must offer a zero-cost EWA option for users, among other requirements. <laughs> to ensure compliance with the established regulations, sections 20 through 28 authorize the commissioner to conduct examinations of licensees and requires the commissioner to charge a fee for such examinations. The legislation was premised upon the concept that FID needs the tools necessary to enforce compliance with the law, and sections 22 through 31 further outline the full extent of its ability to do so. Sections 32 and 33 establish first-in-the-nation consumer protection rules and practices, including, but not limited to, the following. EWA providers must enact consumer compliant Compl excuse me, consumer complaint policies and procedures to respond to questions and complaints by users. EWA providers must clearly disclose terms, fees, and conditions to users and must allow EWA users to cancel a subscription at any time at no cost to the user. Providers must comply with all privacy and data protection laws. Providers that allow users to pay tips or gratuities must provide certain disclosures to users concerning the use of those funds. Providers that debit for repayment must notify users of the date of repayment and reimburse for any overdraft fees caused by uh, reimbursing for the incorrect amount or on the incorrect date. 
Providers may not accept payment of fees from a user via credit card and may not require a user's credit report or credit score to determine eligibility for EWA services. EWA providers may not charge late fees, interest, or any other penalty or charge for a user's failure to pay any outstanding fees. EWA providers may not file suit against a user to collect outstanding fees. These non-recourse aspects of EWA regulation are an important consumer protection feature that distinguishes EWA products from other predatory and high interest financial products and loans. Section 34 mandates EWA providers to submit annual reports to FID that will allow FID to maintain effective regulatory oversight over the industry. And these rules are based on model requirements that have been enacted in other states, including California. Section 36, importantly, distinguishes EWA services and products from loans and other financial products. Because the fundamental aspect of EWA service involves access to earned but just unpaid income, Section 36 acknowledges that EWA providers are not lenders in the traditional sense and that EWA products are not loans under Nevada law. This bill also exempts employer integrated earned wage access providers from provisions governing businesses that transmit money as stated in Section 35. Section 41 establishes important effective dates that allow FID to begin the regulatory and administrative rulemaking process immediately upon passage and approval that allow existing EWA providers who are operating under an MOU or other temporary arrangement with FID to continue operating while they complete the application and review processes established under the bill and establish an automatic sunset date that requires the legislature to revisit the EWA statute and determine in the future if it wishes to extend or otherwise revise the EWA rules that SB 290 proposed. Chair Spearman and committee members, this concludes my remarks. I, of course, would urge your support for Senate Bill 290, which aims to create that comprehensive regulatory framework for earned wage access providers and users in our state. By implementing licensing and regulation, we can ensure that these services operate responsibly, are transparent, are transparent and work in the best interests of workers and businesses alike. I would now like to introduce some representatives from the industry who can give some additional comments. Madam Chair, um, these industry leaders include Daily Pay, Earnin, and Pay Active to provide further explanation of the earned wage access industry so that the committee has a full understanding of what it is we are trying to accomplish with this bill. Thank you. Uh, do you have someone on Zoom as well? On telephone? Okay. All right. Yes, we do. Okay. Great. Um, for the record, my name is Ryan Naples. Uh, good morning. I, I'm from Daily Pay. We provide earned wage access or EWA to employees in Nevada and throughout the United States. This morning, I'm joined by Yvonne Chow from Earnin and Molly Jones from PayActive, who will be joining us from Zoom, which are two other EWA companies. In Nevada, more than 100,000 employees have utilized EWA from over 600 in-state businesses, or about 10% of the state's workforce. 2,000 active individual users of only my company currently live in the committee chair's district, and 6,000 constituents of the committee chairs have actually made at least one transfer, and that's only just my committee, only just my company. As the majority leader mentioned, in today's economy, everyday obligations and emergency events do not neatly arise every two weeks or once a month when an employer runs payroll. In addition, Nevadans in the, mo in the modern tech economy increasingly demand responsive HR departments and payroll systems. EWA companies solve for these disconnects by facilitating access to already earned wages for either no fee or a very low fee. Several years ago, there were only a handful of EWA providers. Today, there are several dozen that each have slightly different flavors, but all share a few key tenants. First, all EWA is based on wages earned. Workers can only access their own money they've already worked for. We are not credit. Because our product is not a loan, no EWA provider charges interest or late fees. All EW product, EWA products are also non-recourse, meaning the risk of an employer failing to make payroll is on the EWA provider, not the worker. There's also no requirement to repay no collection activity and no credit bureau reporting for non-payment. While there are some costs associated with EWA, most providers often uh, most providers offer at least one way to access earned wages at no cost, such as through an ACH bank transfer that arrives the next business day. This for users who would like their wages instantly, they can elect a nominal fee of about $3 for instant delivery to any to any bank. This optional fee structure, which is similar to Venmo, um, and is less than an out-of-network uh, ATM fee is partly why EWA is a responsible low-cost alternative for working Nevadans. Without EWA, available options to access funds quickly 
can be very costly if you do not have great credit. They include overdrafting a bank account for an average fee of $29 nationally, a pawn loan where fees average $150, or a payday loan where the average fee in Nevada over, the, over four months is $924, the second highest in the nation. In 2021, Daily Pay commissioned an independent research to assess EWA's impact on its users. The data showed that 95% of users previously reliant on payday loans would no longer use these high cost predatory products once gaining access to Daily Pay's EWA service. This would save these individuals between $630 and $930 a year. The results were similarly positive for, for frequent overdrafters. Since EWA is not credit, our industry conducts no underwriting and does not base its low transaction fees or access to wages on credit worthiness. We also do not charge these incredibly low fees in installments. For these reasons, an APR rate, which would be misleadingly high, even with our very low fees, are incongruous to how EWA is structured. These rates would therefore not represent the actual cost and potential savings available to EWA users compared to other far more costly financial products. As an industry, we are supportive of this bill's first in the nation consumer protections and requirements for all earned wage access companies, and we thank you for your time. I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Yeah, yeah. We'll take questions after the full presentation. Great. Distinguished members of the committee, thank you for having me today. My name is Yvonne Chow, and I am here to testify in support of SB 290 on behalf of Earnin. Earnin provides customers with access to their earnings as they are earned without mandatory fees, interest, or recourse. Oftentimes, as the majority leader mentioned, bills and pay cycles are misaligned, and workers get into deep debt, paying high fees to compensate for the liquidity gap between paydays. People are not more dependent on earned wage access than they are on their paychecks, and Earnin is both a safety net and a budgeting tool to meet that unique need. This is not just a company pitch, but real-life impact. Since Earnin's launch in 2014, we've served over 43,000 Nevadan workers, with 19,000 being in the last year alone. In a 2021 study across the customers of three companies, 87% said that earned wage access helped them to take better care of themselves and their families, and 44% said that without earned wage access, that they would consider not paying certain bills on time. These findings are reinforced by the 649 Nevadans who have benefited from earned wage access and signed onto a letter in support of SB 290 in the couple of days preceding today's hearing. Earnin truly sees ourselves as consumer advocates. We are actively finding better solutions for consumers with their input along the way. At Earnin, for profit does not mean for profit at the expense of consumers. Not supporting earned wage access would drive those in need to alternatives like overdrafts and other high cost products. And I urge you to support this bill today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak again, and I look forward to continuing to work together toward our common goal of serving Nevadans well and being there for them meaningfully when they need it. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I do believe we have one final um, presenter who is uh, with us via Zoom. Hi there, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. It's nice to see you all again. For the record, my name is Molly Jones and I'm the Vice President for Government Relations at PayActive, which is an employer integrated earned wage access provider. We partner with over 150 employers in Nevada, including many small businesses, and have served over 10,000 Nevada workers. Thank you, Senate Majority Leader Canisaro and Deputy Leader Lang and others for your leadership on this important issue. We have also appreciated the opportunity to work with legal aid on this bill. Access to earned wages can make all the difference for someone living paycheck to paycheck. Without this critical service, workers would have to turn to traditional high cost products like payday loans, title loans, and credit card debt. Loans against 401k plans are also particularly concerning for casino workers in Nevada. EWA is not a lending product nor a predatory product. Predatory products like payday loans require credit checks, they impact credit scores. They have origination fees upward of $100 that are followed by ballooning interest rates. Payday lenders also have recourse against the consumer. EWA has none of these characteristics. EWA provides access to money that has already been earned by work that has already been performed. It is non-recourse. It has no impact on the consumer's credit score. It comes with no inability to pay risk. It has free and low cost options for the user, less than most ATM fees. 
There are no finance charges. It is safe and trusted by employers, and it does not meet the legal de definition of a loan in Nevada or at the federal level. EWA is a unique payroll innovation that has the opportunity to provide tremendous benefit to over half of working Nevadans who live paycheck to paycheck. This bill creates a number of very strong consumer protections, and we're glad to support the bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, committee, questions? Uh, Senator Daly. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, read the bill, and then I read the reread it again <laughs> with the amendment. So, so thank you on that. So, first question is in your amended part in Section Five, uh, where it says what uh, earned but unpaid income means, and then you list out uh, more precisely what it was before. Um, so, I question is: so, what other things that aren't listed, or would there maybe put in the, the term does not include such things as vacation pay, sick time, bonuses, those types of things? So, it wouldn't include that. So, it was clear. Um, it was Go ahead. Yeah, for the yeah for the record, Ryan Naples. Um, correct. This is limited to wages. It's not for it's not for hours for vacation hours or sick pay, sick time. It's not Bo for bonuses like or anything. And, and I was just wondering if you needed to to say that. Um, if I can, a couple more. All right, <laughs> very good. Thank you. So one thing that occurred to me reading this after hearing another bill. Um, earlier in this session from a bill that was passed in a previous session regarding the applications and the information that's on the application. A lot of that, we just had a bill came back and we said, hey, we didn't have the framework and we needed to make the application. Some of that information is confidential. Um, so I didn't know if you wanted to add some of that in that that would be confidential, but make sure that the license information would be public. Um, and I didn't know if you wanted to maybe add that in because we just corrected it in another bill we had earlier. Um, which then gets me to, I think, page seven of your um, of your amendment. I think it's section 29, subsection four. Um, it says the complaint with the commissioner pursuant to subject, all documents, other information filed. Uh, you're making all of that confidential to me. The, you should have at least, maybe you don't have to put proprietary information on there, but if there's a complaint against someone and there's a filing, uh, similar to what the contractor's board does or whatever, said, hey, there's a complaint process or this was, this was the result, this is what they did, and this is what the outcome was. You don't have to put proprietary information from your investigation, but I think the complaint should be made public if people have got uh, complaints uh, against them. And then... Uh, on your part in here, let me find it. And, and Madam Chair, if I if I may, I just wanted to um, dovetail on the point that was just made by Senator Daly, Nicole Canazaro, Senate District Six. So in this particular um, provision under Section Twenty Nine, Subsection Four, um, the complaint itself would be something that could be um, disclosed, and certainly there's discretion here for the commissioner to disclose information that might be necessary in order to ensure that there is compliance with um, consumer protection pieces. So to the extent that there was something that came out of an investigation that would fulfill the other requirements that are included in here for consumer protection, that's something that could be disclosed. I think the intent of this is to ensure that that investigation can occur um, without all of that information being public, but that the complaint and, and resulting, um, you know, should there be a finding anything that would allow for additional consumer protections um, would vest with, with the FID commissioner. And so um, I don't think the intent is to make everything completely confidential so that no one would ever know if there were complaints or if there was someone who, um, you know, an actor in this, a, a provider that was not uh, complying with the structure that we've put in place, um, but rather to allow for that process to, that investigatory process to occur and then to allow for that kind of thing. Um, any results of that to be made public. Yeah, and if I can, Madam Chair, uh, most most of those types of things, investigations, while the investigation is going on, it's, it's all uh, confidential. And then some of the information that you gather during the investigation, financial documents, whatever it might be, would all be confidential. But if you make a finding and there's a report, the fact that there was a complaint and there was a finding, that should, in my view, should be public uh, uh, on that. 
Um, and thank you for that, um, Senator Daly, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Daly. Let's go to Rick. Great, thank you. Nicole Canazaro, Senate District 6. And I think that is the intent of this particular provision, and to allow FID to do that, then disclose those pieces of it with respect to the complaint and the um, outcome of that investigation in order to ensure those consumer protection pieces. Right. And then hopefully we can just be clear, clear on the language. So I did have another question, 32. You put in language about a tip, and it says it, who, who gets the tip? <laughs> <laughs> or who, who gets the tip? I didn't. Uh... Yvonne Chow, for the record, Ernan. Um, the company gets the tip. It allows us to give people access to their earnings without paying a fee or tip at all when they need it. And then there's a, if I can find it, sorry, final question. Yeah, let's, let's come back. Uh, I think okay. Senator Stone, do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just, as the way I understand this, 100% uh, of the risk of the payment to the worker is on the company, correct? There's uh, no recourse uh, in case uh, there's any issues of malf uh, not malfeasance, but uh, the instability of the employer. If they were to go bankrupt or something like that, that would be your issue uh, with them. But I assume that if you accidentally make a, an overpayment to a uh, beneficiary that you you could have some recourse and say well we paid you a hundred dollars more than we probably should have we we had that we can get that back I assume if you make an error or you have no recourse even if you make an error on your own volition uh, yeah Ryan Naples for the record right we also have no we don't have any recourse if we make an error ourselves yeah okay are you allowed to credit the next uh, request against that uh, error if, if the, there was one? I believe we've only had three have have had three percent of our the, the only there it is no recourse and the only things that we ever deal with regularly is when um, a employer actually makes a mistake and we do like an overpayment because of an employer's mistake and um, we have never really had a situation where like we've made a mistake essentially it's really usually the it's the employers um, and in those situ in those hypotheticals there's no there is no recourse. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that yeah, answer. Yeah. Okay. And Senator uh, Kanazaro, Ma Madam uh, Majority Leader, um, thank you for bringing this legislation forward. Uh, it, it's going to help uh, a lot of my clientele that uh, work paycheck to paycheck. Um, I'm a, in, in reading the legislation, this only pertains to private employers. In other words, um, if somebody's getting a regular unemployment check, uh, from the state of Nevada, there can't be a relationship between the state and these companies to advance money because these people often run into issues as well. Um, thank you for the question, Senator Stone. Nicole Canazaro, Senate District 6. Um, that is correct. It's not like an unemployment piece, right? You have to be employed. It's with private employers. Um, I think there are some folks who can use it outside <coughs> if they have a governmental employer, depending on the provider. Um, but it is not, it wouldn't apply to the situation that you mentioned with someone who might be getting like an unemployment check from the state. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I hope this passes into law, and I hope that maybe in the future we can look at uh, unemployment benefits or disability benefits that are a regular occurrence for some people that uh, run into some financial issues. And I just want to say that um, I was brought up in Anaheim, California, and I remember at 10 years old, my dad used to leave my mom a check every week for 200 bucks. And out of that 200 bucks, my mom had to pay the mortgage. She had to pay for the food. She has to pay for insurance, car payments. And I remember the hysteria that, God forbid, my sister or I got sick and we had to go to a doctor. You know, how are we going to pay this doctor? And back then, we didn't have insurance like we do today. And to go see a doctor, it was typically a fee for service, minimum $100, which back in 1966 was a lot of money. And so I remember living, and instead of milk, my mom bought Hawaiian Punch Concentrate. And to have milk with... Uh, Captain Crunch or something was a big luxury for us to get something like that. And Kraft macaroni and cheese was the entree, not once, but sometimes two to three times a week because that's all we could afford. And my mom taught me going to grocery stores how to divide the cost by the number of ounces so I could become a good shopper in, in my life. And, uh, and I attribute a lot of my, my business skills to my mom's business skills of survival. I wish that during my youth that my mom had the access to a program like this that would have given her the ease of knowing that uh, she could cover the expenses uh, without losing our house at her. Her parents, my grandparents, gave them a $1,500 down payment assistance for a $15,000 home 
in Anaheim, California. So um, I thank you for bringing this legislation forward. It is going to help, and it already is helping, thousands of people in, in Nevada that otherwise would have to incur credit card transfer fees, 5% fee just to transfer, right? Right off the top. So if you have to, if you have to transfer a thousand bucks, you're paying fifty bucks of that right off the top to the company. Not to mention the kind of interest they charge and the hard money lending, putting up your pink slip on your car, and jeopardizing your ability to get to work. Uh, this is a tremendous service for the citizens of Nevada, and I encourage all my colleagues to support it. Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Spearman. I, too, uh, like my colleague, uh, appreciate um, the guardrails that the, fine, the FID is um, putting into place and that this bill for consumer protection. Also, I just wondered, uh, logistically, you mentioned several times in your presentation that this was not a loan. Could you clarify that? Um, because who, who fronts the money? Right, and I should say, you know, the reason why we're not alone, uh, Ryan Naples, for the record, thank you, uh, from Daily Pay. You know, we are, earn wage access is not alone because it's, you know, the person, the, our, our users have to work first before they can gain any access to it. And the, you know, then, you know, the our products don't, you know, then have any sort of characteristics that are, that uh, define how a loan actually is able to um, come into creation. And so there is no underwriting, there's no assessment of creditworthiness, nothing is based on creditworthiness, like the amount of wages people can access, the transaction fee doesn't vary based on creditworthiness, nothing is paid in installments, um, there's no interest charged, and then there's the non-recourse part of it. So it's, you know, the, um, it's very far from being alone, and you know the we're like the uh, I would say like the the solution to the the predatory loan world, if you will. So that's helpful. Thank you so much, and I like this legislation. Thank you for bringing it forward, Senator Scheibel. Uh, just to follow up on my colleague's question, so. F um, for an employer integrated model, would the paycheck then actually be reduced by the amount that the person had previously accessed in, you know, maybe the previous two right. weeks or previous month? Right, Ryan Naples for the record. So, right, so when you're integrated with, with payroll, uh, and again, this is totally optional, the, the way it works is someone will decide to access, let's say, $100, and then we'll keep track of how much they work the rest of the week. And then at the end of the pay cycle, the uh, paycheck will just be the, the normal amount, less what they've already accessed. So it's really seamless. There no, the, to be honest, the, the employee and the employer don't really notice anything. It's, it is like payroll on demand, frankly, um, in a very uh, like kind of one direction sense, if you will. Um, and Madam Chair, if I can add one thing, because I think both of the last questions, um, Nicole Canizaro, Senate District 6, from Senator Scheibel and Senator Buck, um, the, I think the important thing to remember and why this is a little different than a loan or some other advance of some sort is that these are wages that have already been earned. So they're already hours or jobs or what days that have been worked. It's just that they're waiting for that next pay period. Um, and this allows them to access some of those funds early. And so it's not as though this is money that they are not entitled to. If they were to, you know, be paid on a daily basis, they would get that money every day, but that's not how payroll works typically. And so this is all money that they have already earned, which I think is a big, um, that's a big difference in, in what we're talking about regulating here versus some of the other more traditional pieces that this committee is familiar with. Yeah, Senator Daly. Easy, easy question on this one. So section 22, page five of your amendment at line 42, when I read that, the person claims to be within a 3735 authority. What, what is that? Is that typo or is there some reference there that I don't I didn't see 
I didn't get the reference is all. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Senator Daly, Nicole Canazaro, Senate District 6. Uh, that is just a typo. It should just say within the authority. So apologize for that. We will correct it. All right, so seeing no further questions from the committee, um, we'll open a hearing in support. So those who are in support here in Carson City um, or in Las Vegas, please come to the table. There are three chairs here. There's two, two chairs in Las Vegas. Okay, let's start down in Las Vegas. Looks like they're ready. Please proceed. Senator Spearman and committee members. My name is Barbara Paulson, and I'm a member of Nevadans for the Common Good, a broad-based organization of 30-plus dues-paying congregations and nonprofits across the Las Vegas Valley. Nevadans for the Common Good has seen firsthand the impacts of a minimally regulated um, payday lending industry, with multiple individual members and families personally involved in the uh, exploitation of those loan products and the never-ending cycle of interest and debt. This is why we strongly supported Senate Bill 201 during the 2019 legislative session, which provided the authority to establish an up, uh, upfront enforcement system or regulation for predatory lenders. We followed that through the regulation process and are happy to see that in effect, uh, in effect today. We hope to see additional regulations on those types of loans. We see this new product as another avenue for unregulated financial pr products that can cause harm to our community. Many of our community members who are underemployed or struggling to keep a roof over their heads, as you've clearly addressed this morning, will be enticed by these products that may overpromise what they can do and trap people in an endless debt cycle. Nevadans for the Common Good strongly supports SB 290 requiring licensing, licensing of these entities. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, we'll come back up here to Carson City. <laughs> okay, uh, there we go. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Jerron Levi. I am Senior Vice President, Head of Government Affairs at the American FinTech Council. Uh, we're a national trade association based in Washington that represents banks and non-banks in a variety of business models, providing a range of financial products and services, including earn, or earn wage access providers. What distinguishes AFC as a trade, though, is the high bar um, um, it has set for members around consumer protection and the trade support for regulation that supports responsible innovation. AFC has embraced a 36% rate cap standard, for example, on consumer loan products and has set high bar standards around buy now, pay later, as well as uh, earn wage access. Um, at the outset, I want to say that as a former state uh, delegate myself from the great state of Maryland, uh, as well as someone who was in the labor movement for 15 years and spent a lot of time um, advocating for strong consumer protections in housing and financial uh, services, I fully appreciate your side of the, the dais and the balance you're trying to strike here. Uh, of ensuring strong consumer protections around earned wage access products uh, and also facilitating a um, competitive financial marketplace where consumers have what I call the three A's, availability of options around financial products and services, accessibility uh, across the credit risk spectrum uh, and for those who may be underserved, as well as affordability. Earn wage access products, um, we believe, meet the three A's uh, provide, and also provide needed and affordable alternatives to high cost options uh, in the marketplace. Regulation of EWA is in its early stage. We support the state setting out strong standards and parameters around this product. Um, and as a trade, we've really adhered to some key principles here for our members, 
robust wage of verification, so access can be based on wages earned, non-recourse for the worker, free options and cost transparency, which you all have talked uh, about. Finally, um, it is important uh, that the clarification around EWA is not being a loan or a credit product. That is key. Um, you've heard a lot about what distinguishes EWA from uh, credit products, you know, no credit checks, no late fees or penalties, no recourse, doesn't impact the user's credit score, uh, and the like. Um, it also, as you've heard, doesn't require, uh, doesn't allow uh, the e EWA provider to pursue collections uh, against the consumer. Regulation clarifying that it's not a loan uh, is key to keeping these protections in place and also keeping the product as affordable uh, as, as possible. Um, EWA, as you know, some of the data demonstrates, really provides uh, a lot of benefit uh, in terms of replacing some of the more pred predatory high-cost products in the, in the market, payday and, and other things. Um, I urge you to support uh, Senate Bill uh, 290, uh, allowing workers to access their wages early is an option that Nevada consumers deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know Senator Muse? Of course. Oh, it's my brother. It's my guy. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. Like, not really, but we say that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. going to text him after the hearing. Okay, and, and, Pat, and Pat Lawson. <laughs> Pat Lawson. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, yes. And, and we're the only two in here that got the memo. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> A real connection okay. here. I love it. <laughs> Great. Good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Tapring Paquato, and I serve as Senior Director for State Government Relations for the Western United States for Chamber of Progress, a tech industry coalition committed to ensuring all Americans benefit from technological leaps. We support SB 290, a bill that will regulate earned wage access, EWA, services that help workers bridge the gap until next payday. This frees workers from dependency on payroll cycles and alternative offers options like predatory lending practices. The proper regulation of EWA services can be a benefit to Nevada, where the FINRA Foundation reports that 56% of Nevadans are living paycheck to paycheck. Cus consumer research conducted by leading EWA providers in 2021 showed that this service is mostly used to pay bills on time, buy groceries, and avoid late fees. Eight out of 10 of their EWA customers feel that these services are the best available option to help manage their spending and say their life has significantly improved after using these products. Based on consumer feedback to Earnin, a fintech company that provides on-demand access to already earned income, EWA is helping people make ends meet by providing a better alternative to paying bills than paying bills late or using credit cards with high annual percentage rates that could cause a backslide into debt. Further, according to a study by Experian from last year, the average credit card balance in Nevada is $6,220, slightly above the national average. Because EWA is not a credit product, nor does it extend credit to its customers, increased usage of these services by residents could lead to decreased credit card balances. In this post-COVID inflationary economy, the usage of EWA has increased across the country. From 2018 up until now, EWA services have tripled in usage, primarily in response to consumers adapting to a financial environment where they have household expenses that cannot wait till payday. From single parents to the 95, nine to five workers, EWA has been and will continue to be a valuable option that works for their families and budgets. We respectfully request your support for SB 290. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Trevor Parrish, and I'm the Manager of Government Affairs at the Vegas Chamber. The Vegas Chamber is in support of SB 290. The passage of SB 290 is important because it will create and provide regulatory oversight for a new and emerging financial services tool for the benefit of Nevada's workers. This bill provides regulations and accountability, such as being licensed and bonded. 
We believe these provisions are important to the public and the industry. These companies will help Nevada's workers access their salaries and wages early without needing to take out a loan, as they are not a loan company. Thank you for your consideration and your support of Nevada's workers. Thank you. Um, additional support here in Carson City, support in Las Vegas, BPS support on the phone. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you, BPS. Uh, we'll now move to uh, testimony in opposition. Anyone in opposition? Here in Carson and in Vegas. Yes, sir. Chair, members of the committee, Jonathan Norman with the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers. Um, you know, I want to thank the sponsor and, and actually all the providers who have worked with us to to get meaningful consumer protections in there. I would say that we are very close to um, being in support of this bill. We're just not quite there. We have a meeting scheduled tonight at five to go over final tweaks to the language. Um, and I think a lot of community partners have, you know, deferred to legal, the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers to take the lead on this. And um, we are, like I said, very close to I think language that would have us in support, um, and there's a meeting this this evening at five to go over those final tweaks, um, and I would appreciate having that time. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here in Carson City? Seeing none here, none in Vegas. We'll now go to uh, neutral. Anyone testifying neutral? Oh, I'm sorry. Opposition. I'm sorry. Opposition. Okay, opposition, did I see somebody come to the table? Okay. Uh, legal aid, I think one of our committee members had a question for you. Uh, sorry about that. Thank you, Chair Spearman, for the indulgence. I just wondered, uh, so we could get it on record, what what are your problems with uh, this? Because it seems to me that it is a no-brainer in that um, the only alternatives are paying late fees to credit cards, um, having to go to a dollar loan center or payday loan center to um, get a high-interest loan, um, begging family members. I don't know. You can probably come up with a few more, but... What are your problems with this bill? Um, Jonathan Norman, Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers. So it's just little tweaks with the language that were being worked on yesterday, and we're just not quite there. I fundamentally, like I wouldn't have engaged in, I don't even know, probably 10 meetings over the last month. I've worked on this bill more than I've worked on some of my own, um, because I do think it is um, fundamentally better than those options, and it will be better at the same time I think it's important to acknowledge the, the same arguments of we have to regulate to protect consumers are what brought us payday lending regulation in our state, and we're now the second worst you know, behind Idaho. So dialing in those consumer protections is really important to our organization, organization and the community partners that are looking at us. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think we will be in support of this bill, and I think the changes are pretty minor. Um, in language, right? Like, I don't think this is, we're not going over this for the first time tonight. We've had so many meetings, and I think we're very close. Um, and, and specifically, you know, what that sunset looks like um, is, is one of them, and what, what happens at the sunset. Um, what happens with reporting? Um, like, what, what are we collecting? And so just some of those details, and then I think Senator Daly had some questions that you know, are in line with hammering out those fine details so that we make sure consumers in our state 
are protected, but also can use this product in lieu of payday lending, right? Because I fundamentally think this is better than payday lending, which is why I've engaged so much on these, you know, there's a bill on the assembly side, so both of them. Yes, I think it serves the very people that you help. So. I agree. Thank you. Yep. We're just not quite there. So it's not, okay. <laughs> you know, I told them I'd be in soft opposition, um, but I would like the time to work out those last details. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, BPS, anyone on the phones in opposition? If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 290, please press star 9 290. Now to take your place in the queue. Opposition to 290. If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 290, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Hello, my name is Lorena Cardenas, L-O-R-E-N-A-C-A-R-D-E-N-A-S. As far as taking advantage of technological leap services uh, to get wage advan advantage, based on my own experience, that never works. You throw off the order of things, what ends up happening is that people will go longer days in between what would have been the actual pay date to the next pay date, and you end up getting in trouble there. I mean, unless you're proposing people continue to repeatedly do this. So I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think we should be making it easier to tap into uh, wage salaries. We're adults. We know how to, we should know how to uh, handle our finances. So I oppose SB 290. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, hello. This is Frank Dombrowski. It's D O M B R O S K I, representing FlexWage Solutions. Uh, FlexWage is the uh, original uh, innovator or creator of uh, on demand payer early wage access back in 2010. Um, obviously, we're a very staunch and strong supporter of EWA and the, and the very strong benefits it has to the consumer. And we're very much in favor of regulation um, around EWA providers. Um, the issue we have with, uh, you know, SB 209 in particular is that it, it's failing to differentiate between the different types or models of EWA. And by that, I mean um, there are employer-sponsored models versus consumer direct models. Um, obviously, with a consumer direct model, the provider does not have the data to really um, verify that the employee has worked within the pay cycle. So they're effectively taking pay stub information and they are calculating or guessing that the employee is going to work a like number of hours the next pay cycle. So it's not verified relative to work performed. Um, second uh, differentiation I think needs to be uh, brought out and, and really worked through in the and the regulation is uh, the source of funding. There are some models that are funded by the employer, which um, is the entity that has the um, debt, if you will, accumulating to pay the employee versus a vendor funded model where you are effectively fronting or lending money uh, and, re and recovering it on pay date. Um, again, I mentioned data accuracy and that is really the, um, the true access to payroll and time and labor data. So you can, uh, down to the hour, make sure that you're not um, you know, paying an individual a loan or, or forward money uh, because you've verified that they have actually earned the money. Um, a couple of additional elements that really differentiate um, you know, true earned wage from uh, you know, more or less lending um, is the um, the uh, reclaiming of the money through payroll deduction versus um, the two other methods that are in the in the marketplace. One is payroll intercept, where the employer sends a, a, an employee's 
entire pay to a third party uh, fintech vendor, and that vendor then re redistributes that money out to the employees. So thank you, sir. Um, and, Hello, and again, sir. Should be, can you can you submit the rest of your yeah. testimony in writing? We've reached the end of two minutes. If you can submit the rest of your testimony in writing, sir, we would appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank We've you. already submitted, and thank, thank you for you. your time mm -hmm. and great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. BPS. Anyone else? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll go to neutral. Anyone here in Carson City? Neutral. I see two occupying the chairs down there. You all have to forgive us. We've been sitting in these chairs since 8 o'clock. Okay. Go to Las Vegas. I don't see anyone up here. Thank you. Las Vegas. Good morning, morning Chair. Uh, Chair Spearman and committee members, I'm Sandy O'Loughlin with the Nevada Financial Institutions Division. I'm the commissioner, and with me is Deputy Commissioner Mary Young. We are in neutral um, with SB 290. We have worked with the um, stakeholders, and we will continue to work with them um, on the, any outstanding items. And we're here for any questions. There are none. There are none. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no one else in neutral? Okay, Majority Leader, would you like to come up? And I need the, the presenters. Oh, I'm sorry, on the phone. Here we go. And, and those who are presented, uh, we need to get cards over to the committee secretary. Okay, so anyone on the phone in neutral? If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 290, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Um, uh, yes, Madam Chairwoman, um, the system did not allow me to oppose SB 290. Um, it didn't. It didn't ask me to do the star six. So, if I can, my name is Leslie Quinn. I oppose SB 290. I do not believe uh, borrowing money from your employer is the way to go. It's almost like a hard money loan, even though it is much less than some of these uh, predatory lenders. I think that we need to learn how to balance our budgets. We are adults. If you don't work, you don't eat. Um, my solution is why, why not lower the cost of food, uh, energy, and gas? It's almost tripled, not only gas for your car, but uh, southwest gas. If we can lower all of our utilities, and uh, even at our national level, why are we giving out money to other countries, um, $100 billions. We should be taking care of our own here, our own U.S. citizens, and supporting our U.S. citizens first and foremost, primarily, and not uh, putting in more legislature to give monies to illegals. Um, I love all people, but we need to take care of Nevadans. They work hard for their money. So please oppose SB 290. Thank you, ma'am. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. I believe now we can call the majority leader back up. Uh, closing comments and addressing any concerns. Begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Nicole Canazaro, Senate District 6. Um, so a couple of things. First, I would like this committee to be aware that there have been many, many meetings, um, starting from even last session on this particular issue. Um, meetings with up to 20, 25 different industry representatives. So. Um, this is a bill that has been a collaboration and has taken into account many of the concerns and I think that is why you are seeing that there were many folks um, who work within this space who were here today to support the bill and that is because we took a lot of those concerns into consideration. We have made significant amendments to this bill um, and to the extent that there may have been at least one individual who I believe just maybe had emailed my office today um, on this particular issue expressing concerns many of which I believe are, are addressed within the conceptual amendment that was presented to this committee. Um, there should be no room in this bill of all bills uh, to argue that you either weren't part of that discussion or weren't part of those hearings or weren't part of those meetings um, because there have been many with many people, both in person 
and on Zoom with multiple options to participate. So I wanted that. I wanted the committee to be aware of that. Um, we appreciate the work of the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada and agree that we have to get the consumer protection pieces right um, because I think that that is an important function of this. Um, and on that note, to the extent that there are arguments that this is money that is being borrowed from an employer or being borrowed from somewhere else, this is money that an employee is entitled to the day that they work that hour. Um, if they were to be let go the next hour, they are still entitled to that money. So this is employee's money. We're just allowing for some more flexibility in terms of pay periods um, and in terms of payroll. And that's what this bill is seeking to do. But I do think those consumer protection pieces are important. And again, um, to the extent that there were concerns um, highlighted for how this money may be repaid or why this is not a loan. It's important to note that this is money that is already earned and that there are not recourses from these companies for to um, the participants. And so I think that's an important piece as well. We are going to continue um, to have some meetings, hopefully shore up the last little remaining pieces of concerns on this particular bill um, and hope to present you with a final amendment that will um, sort of answer a lot of the things that we think are pertinent in this bill um, because like I said there has been a lot of work that has gone into this bill we are very appreciative of the committee's time your diligent questions um, and allowing us to be here to present this thank you have there been many 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 people <laughs> uh, Nicole Candazaro Senate District 6 lots of people all the people <laughs> okay thank you majority leader and with that we will close the hearing on Senate bill 290 and And we'll open the hearing on Senate Bill 333. Senator Neal. Senator Neal. Okay. And Senator Neal, thank you so much for your patience. Um, you know, it's been, this, this day has been a long week. So let me know. It's been a long. Senator Neal, begin when you're ready, please. Thank you. I am Senator Dina Neal here to present SB uh, 333. I have some opening public policy statements around why I'm bringing a cryptocurrency bill. Hopefully you guys all have the amendment. Um, I will apologize that the version of the bill came out and it did not meet my intent of what was supposed to be established. I had some crypto folks come uh, speak to me and say, are you just trying to charge us 5% for existence? And the answer is no. It is um, was supposed to be a recovery fund for fraud, abuse, and manipulation of vulnerable populations. So I want to start off with some background information. Cryptocurrency scammers have stolen over 1 billion from 46,000 people since the start of uh, 2021, according to the Federal Trade Commission report. Um, and then from October 1st to 2019 through March 31st of 2020, um, I want to just show the timeline. We actually had 570 cryptocurrency investment scams reported, indicating a $7.5 million in total loss. The following year, October 1st, 2020 through March 31st, 2021, there were nearly 6,792 people who reported a loss of over $80 million on these type of scams being that the reported median loss was somewhere between $1,900 and $2,600 of individuals who reported the scams. About 92% of the cryptocurrency investment scams um, from October 1st, 2020 through March 31st, 2021 are classified as miscellaneous investments and the consumer age ranged roughly from 20 to 39 years of age that represented $35 million of the $80 million that was lost in cryptocurrency as a payment method. Under the FTC, because I use FTC and FBI for my data, FTC reported uh, cryptocurrency losses from January 2021 to March 2022, and for investment-related fraud, $575 million, 
romance scams, 185 million, business imposters, 93 million, and then government imposters, 43 million. In the FBI Internet Crime Report of 2022, business email scams represented um, roughly a $1.8 million loss. They did a general um, breakdown of nationally that ages 50 to 59 represented about 64,551 people at the price tag of $1.8 billion. Nationally, ages 60 plus represented about 88,632 people with a price tag of 3.1 billion. And so I'm listing that out for you because the FBI did the general internet crimes and then they break down <coughs> romance crimes and then business, in it, business email crimes and then other crimes in categories. But it's important to note because in my um, bill and in my amendment, I speak to vulnerable populations that are 21 and under and then seniors. And so I'm sure the question is, well, why did she select those particular age groups? Because I didn't know what fight I was getting into. And so it was easier to take vulnerable populations because it's e easier to argue um, that a person who is 21 and under and a senior is uh, typically uh, being manipulated within the cryptocurrency environment. Um, so I want to go through a series of questions, like why does crypto scams happen? Number one, there's no bank to flag a, sus a suspicious transaction. The transfers are irreversible. Um, they're typically novice investors and not really familiar with how crypto works. And the transactions are not FDI insured. Um, the fake investment opportunities that popped up for the $575 million in crypto losses that was reported by FTC have typically come in as an investment strategy, right? They've been treated as a person who is emailing you or befriending you on Facebook or on Instagram and, and building a relationship with you saying, hey, you know, are you interested in crypto investment, I have tips to help you get fast money or earn this money. What I've seen on Facebook, um, I don't know if any of you guys have friends that are doing crypto or, or affiliate humans that you may know, they post these, um, pretty much their account, and it lists how much they've earned in a week, right? And it'll show, it'll show like, I, had t I, I actually got $10,000 today or $8,000 today. And some of, the, some of the Facebook posts are actually a little bit more raunchy to draw your attention. They have some, you know, female, right, maybe holding money, money in very inappropriate places uh, <laughs> to draw your attention to say, hey, I wonder what he's doing and how he's making that money. And maybe I can get this, you know, woman. So the common platforms where crypto scams happen um, are top, pl flat, pa top platforms are Instagram is 32%. This is according to FTC. Facebook is 26%. WhatsApp is 9%. And Telegrams are 7%. So, you know, mostly Telegrams are probably happening at the Walmart, um, I, and I, I don't want to give like a, a bad shout out to Walmart, but Walmart has actually done pretty good at when you go and get the um, money orders or telegrams. They list a advisory. If someone is manipulating you, pressuring you, or telling you to come and transfer money to them, take, a, take another look and re-examine. And I'm actually very happy that they do that because they've been... Um, um, not particularly just crypto, but other people have been manipulating and saying, you know, send money, you know, to London, send money to other countries, and they're thinking that, you know, some family member is being held hostage. So I'm actually pretty happy that um, Walmart is taking a move in that direction. So um, in crypto scan scams, it's an average of four out of ten dollars that are lost in the fraud that is originating from social media. And this is all coming from the Federal Trade Commission. So who does it happen to? Fifty and older are far less likely to report losing money on cryptocurrency uh, investment scams. But when the group 
um, does lose money. The average loss for 50 and over is roughly $3,200. The population between 21 to 49 they report their losses, and the average loss is between 1,900 um, to 2,600. Reported losses for 70 and above, the median loss is around $11,700. And so um, it's a big deal on what's happening, and clearly the reason why I wanted to bring this bill is because most seniors, you're not going back to work when you lose the money. You're not going back to work when you lose your retirement fund. And typically, you're just believing that, you know, I don't know, people have good hearts, good intention, that crypto is, you know, something that you can, they, they think of it, what I encountered, they think of it more of as a long-term investment, but really it's a day-to-day -day investment. If you do crypto, you probably should be monitoring all day and daily to see how your money is fluctuating and growing. I've even had family members that are not here in Georgia, and they were like, hey, you know, I put $1,100 in. And I was like, well, did it grow or did you lose it in the next uh, 30 minutes? I said, because it is not, it is not a fidelity trust investment. Um, it is something where um, you have, you're running high risk in uh, losing the money. So how do they scam? Uh, they befriend you, which I said before. The largest one is the um, romance scam. Uh, someone will get on and, and um, build a relationship with you and say, you know, you know, you're just, you know, Sam, Pam, you're really awesome. Uh, let's build a relationship. They build their trust and then they start talking to you about the crypto investment. They start talking to you about, well, you know, I've made, you know, $10,000 when I did my crypto investment. Would you like to go in on this with me? And then because they've built the trust within that romantic relationship, the person's just like, well, I don't believe this person would, you know, misuse me. Um, so I'll do it. I'll give you some money. And then we'll make money together and we'll be rich. And so typically that doesn't happen. And the romance scam nationally represents about 19 thousand people um, who have roughly lost around $735 million. In Nevada, the victims um, have been about 9,000 victims with internet crimes with a loss of $127 million roughly. And the business um, email scams or the email um, scams have represented about 21,000 people roughly. FBI has basically said that the rise in business email crypto scams called um, business email compromise or email account compromise, which is what I just mentioned, the BEC or the EAC, are typically the first type of direct transfer to cryptocurrency exchanges or what is considered a second hop transfer. So what is a second hop transfer? A victim is typically will provide copies of a driver's license passport. Um, they will then open a crypto wallet in their name. And then once uh, they receive the victim's information, they then open a bank account, and then they're able to receive funds from that business email, which is then transferred to a custodial account. And the reason why they're able to do it is because it's some, it's, um, they say it's tied to a traditional financial institution. So you're thinking, oh, well, this is B of A, or this is Wells Fargo, but it's not. And so a person will engage and give their information over to these entities believing, well, this seems to be legitimate, right? Um, and so I wanted to bring this bill, number one, because crypto over the past, I would say, COVID, has had super fluctuations, but we what the data showed was that there's been super increase in COVID on the scams. And I think probably because of loss of income, loss of money, trying to find money from other people in order to offset where you're going, but there has been an increased amount of citizens nationally and in Nevada who have actually been charmed into giving their um, money away that they can never get back um, because then it gets transferred into crypto. And so if you're not familiar with a wallet, it literally is almost like, a, I mean, well, crypto is like a digital code that 
turns into a transaction or a financial transaction. But you can have a bad wallet and you can have a good wallet. I learned all of this over the summer because I was like, what is that? And it, it literally reminds me of, what is the movie with Neo where there is this code and this chain where you can have the matrix and you literally have this computer system where there is a wallet that is a coded wallet or a coded um it really is a code because it can be owned by several people but a bad wallet is something that ends up getting trapped in the metaverse and you know that you're never well you're probably never getting your money back either way but a bad wallet literally has a person that is probably misusing it and everyone knows that that code and the and the group that's in that transaction is nefarious um so with that um i wanted to give you that background because the amendment really kind of speaks to what i'm doing wanted to set up a recovery fund wanted a five percent uh, fee or assessment to crypto um, businesses so that if fraud or abuse happened we would know who um, have a fund in order to do some form of recovery we're never going to be able to do the full amount the amendment also speaks to setting up a registration because if we don't set up a registration of who is doing business in the state, then we're never going to know. Because this is not one of the ones where you just like put out the bill and like all these crypto people come to you and say, hey, you know, I'm doing all of this. We actually have to figure out how to get them registered and figure out who they are so that when something happens, there's at least a database where you can sit, go and find out who those individuals are that are engaged in this. And so when someone makes an allegation, at least there's information that FID could actually have in their possession to track who that is. So basically that's what the amendment does. Um, it changes award to restitution because it's not a grant. Um, and then the rest of the bill remains the same outside of these sections. And so I'll open myself up for questions. Committee members. Senator Daly. I don't want to disappoint. Hey, come on. No, well, I, if Senator Stone doesn't ask a question, then I'm disappointed. Yeah, okay, okay. I, I have had bills where we haven't had questions. But anyway, so I'm hoping, <clears throat> and maybe you hit on it a little bit, how are we going to, so we're going to have the rule, we're going to try to do a registry or a license, if you will. <clears throat> we're going to tell them we're going to pay this fee, creating the recovery fund. Um, I think the safest thing to do is just not invest in crypto, but that's another story. Um, so how are we going to track down who these people are? Are there actual businesses that are doing this, or is it all online? And uh, I don't know how you solve, solve some of that, but I mean, a step in the right direction, I guess. So. Senator Dean O'Neill, uh, for the record. Um, it's not going to be easy. In the, in the bill, it allows the commissioner to create regulations um, basically, you would establish a registration system. It's mostly online. Some are in SEC institution, um, crypto investors. Um, and so I don't think, I don't, do I think that everyone is going to come once you put in the law and say, okay, I'm going to openly register? Because there are single individuals that are engaged in this. Um, and I think that this is a step to try to get them to, to, you know, fan the bushes and bring them out so we can find out exactly who they are. You know, my first uh, step, Senator Daley, was a direct prohibition in totality, right? And the reason why I didn't do it is because our former uh, Senator Key Keffer had a bill in 2019 that said we couldn't discriminate against Bitcoin or other things. And so I didn't want to run the risk of... I have a direct prohibition, and then he's in the governor's office, and he just vetoes it. Uh, well, not Ben, but the governor on Ben's advice. So I just didn't do that version. But that is the one I prefer. <laughs> if, if I can follow up. And so I understand that maybe at least we can get some people that are registered or whatever you want to do, so then you can start to build a uh, an, an area where people are using this stuff that's – 
you know, only go to a, a registered and have a resource where they can look up and see who's registered and only go to, you know, like a licensed contractor, if you will, and in a similar deal. And, and I know your feeling on, on outlawing it and various things that I remember the discussions we had when we were talking about uh, Internet gaming is, you know, you, we, we said, you know, we're not going to be able to stop it. You're not going to be able to stop it. So we took steps to regulate it and, and engaged from that direction. So I think that's a, this is a step in that direction. So, thank you. Senator Stone. Thank you, Senator Neal, for uh, trying to take on this really uh, complicated and uh, impactful uh, issue. I, I know of a, a senior citizen in, in Nevada that uh, was dealing in crypto and was uh, dealing online with an online romance. The guy's almost 90 years old and he ended up uh, losing $150,000. That was all of his money. That was his nest egg. So uh, I, I applaud your efforts. Um, but I, I assume that many of these virtual currency businesses that you're trying to protect us from, uh, many of them are somewhere out there in the cyber universe that might not even be on the U.S. soil. And um, the 5% uh, fee that's going to be required of them might push more of them into a black market, which, um, and I agree with my, my friend sitting next to me, that people should deal with legitimate companies that are registered in the state, which I think you're trying to do. I think that's great. But this, um, this new uh, fund that you've come up with to try to help make people whole, it, is this only going to reimburse the vulnerable populations, less, less 21 or less, or the seniors? What about the people that are mid-aged that are getting caught up in some of this and, and losing money too? Are they going to be beneficiaries of this as well? Senator Dean and Neal, thank you for the question. I knew that would come up. Um, I mean, I'm open to that amendment. I'm sure FID will put it one heck of a fiscal note on this. Um, but recognizing that the population is much larger who is being, um, I guess, abused, I mean, I would be open to that, um, but I, like I said, I started off with a baby step because I didn't know who was who I was opposing, um, and you can't really argue against vulnerable populations unless something's wrong with you. So, uh, <laughs> but I would be interested in maybe considering that. I don't know what FID is going to say um, because I ultimately was actually going to kill this bill. And then um, it was revived because of Senator Spearman wanting me to do it. But I don't know. I'm open to it. It all depends on how much it's going to cost in order to build that network. I know that when the feds gave restitution, I think from FTC, they didn't get hardly any money. They got like $59. It was very minimal, and it did not replace the money they lost. Additional questions? So I asked uh, Senator Neal to revive it because I have a friend who um, was talked into it by someone who allegedly was a financial planner. And I think uh, about four sessions ago, then Senator Ford had a bill um, that cracked down on people who posed as financial planners but were not certified. Um, and so here's one question. Let me preface this by there's, if there's not a quick investigation, the money's gone, poof. Um, and the person that I know who lost the money um, tried calling the FBI, and the FBI said, we don't know or we can't do anything yet or whatever. Um, and so there was never, you know, two or three weeks went by and there was never anyone who investigated. So um, maybe this is a fiscal note, maybe it's not. Uh, but you know, years ago, you didn't have SSL. You know, when you buy something online or you use a credit card, you didn't have um, a secure socket layer. This, they kind of, so is there a way to put to require them to have something like that so that consumers would know um, if they are legitimate or not because most, most of the scams take place online and they, you know, do a really flashy website and see all these things and they make it look like they're legitimate but they are not. 
Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Dean O'Neill. Um, I don't know because I've been reading about this for not just the summer, but a couple of years. The biggest part of this is the um, anonymity of the person who's transacting on the other end of the code. Um, I know that there's conversation about regulating them and what they do within banks. I know there's conversation about, I don't know how, you know, how you tag them because they have a actual tag or identity within the metaverse. So they know who it is and they know who a bad actor is. And so if a bad actor does an activity like stealing or something, because this, I went through a whole like, like, I don't know what to call it. It wasn't a webinar, but um, they trap them in, right? Depending on the country. So I don't know what that looks like because you would have to figure out what is the code that could stay with them forever so that you could track them. Because I know that if, if, if they move money out, right, so they can move money to South Korea or some other country that's not necessarily regulating it the same way as the United States, and that is their exit point, right, to get money out, because there are different rules over there where they don't care and the money just becomes um, accessible. There's a way to exit if the country doesn't have the same regs. Here, I think we're slow to deal with it because everybody saw it as this new um, alternate currency that was going to change the game, and then it, it's still being seen. Hope it's still being seen right now as a legitimate alternate currency that we should be maintaining. Although there have been a series of stories over the past year of huge fallouts, huge losses. SEC um, failures, even if they register with SEC. And so I don't know what that looks like, to be honest. Thank you. Seeing no additional questions from the committee, uh, we'll open the public hearing in support of Senate Bill 333. I don't see anybody in the room in Las Vegas. I don't see anyone moving forward here. BPS, anyone on the phones? If you would like to testify in support of SB 333, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The, the public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. So we'll move now to opposition. Opposition here in Carson City. Don't see anyone still in Las Vegas. Um, BPS, anyone on the phones? <clears throat> if you would like to testify in opposition to SB 333, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chairwoman Spearman and members of the committee. My name is Wiz Rosard. That's spelled W-I-Z-R-O-U-Z-A-R-D. I'm the Deputy State Director with Americans from Prosperity. And on behalf of our many activists in the state of Nevada, I come before you today in opposition to Senate Bill 333. This legislation targets an emerging industry by imposing overly prescriptive regulations that would deter any meaningful integration and adoption of digital assets in the state of Nevada. The overly prescriptive requirements to operate in the state will deter many businesses from wanting to do business in the state in the first place. The legislature should be focused on ways to empower innovation and attract businesses to this great state of Nevada instead of pursuing uh, proposals such as this that would have the opposite effect. As a nonprofit focused on identifying and removing barriers to enhance the lives of Americans, it is for these reasons that we ask you to oppose Senate Bill 333. If we're talking about theft, we've talk, got to talk about uh, the federal government spending that has led to uh, this uh, overrun of inflation, and it's deprived and robbed people of their wealth. 
And when we talk about the government lockdown and mandates, these are consequences to it, where it's we, the American people, through our savings and, our savings and earnings, uh, where we lose that value. And in response to this marketplace, Senate Bill 333, we think there's better approaches to that. We're more than happy to work with the bill sponsors to ensure that there's a balancing act in ensuring innovative markets like cryptocurrency or any digital asset. It's something Nevada can take pride in. Uh, thank you for your time. Yes, my name is Leslie Quinn, and I uh, oppose SB 333. I don't feel that this bill is ready for what it is trying to accomplish. Um, in addition, I think that it will also cause more problems of, for digital currency to be ushered in and our monies to be controlled. Please oppose SB 333. Thank you. There are no callers to choosing to testify at this time. Uh, anyone here neutral? Here neutral? I don't see anyone in Las Vegas. Chair Spearman, honorable members of the committee. Sina Lloyd, S-E-N-A-L-O-Y-D, Director of Public Policy at Blockchains, Inc., a Web3 ID company. For the record, um, we were initially opposed to SB 333 as it, among other things, proposed to tax the gross uh, receipts of a broad swath of vaguely defined virtual currency activities. But this morning or afternoon, we sit in neutral. Bill sponsor Senator Neal was gracious enough to meet with us yesterday evening and share her conceptual amendment, which addressed most of our concerns. While we agree about the policy behind the bill, namely enhancing consumer protections, we are still concerned that SB 333 seeks to redefine virtual, cur <clears throat> virtual currency, which is currently contained in NRS 361.2284D, as well as the definition of virtual currency businesses uh, that fails to articulate the proper technical details to understand who is regulated and who is defined as a resident in Nevada. But with Senator Neal's assurances that she will work with us and consider language, we are now testifying in neutral, and we, sent, we thank Senator Neal for the conversation and look forward to continuing work with the Senator on the conceptual amendment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, I see someone in Las Vegas, is that FID? Please begin. Good afternoon. Chair Spearman and committee members, Sandy O'Loughlin from the Nevada Financial Institutions Division. Uh, I've worked with um, Senator um, Neal, and um, we are in neutral position and here for any questions. Thank you. There are no questions. So, BPS, anyone on the phone? Uh, neutral. If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 333, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Hi, uh, my name is Katrina Ivanov. I apologize. I wasn't able to get into the queue. I want to testify in opposition. I won't be long. That's all I'm going to say. The same uh, person that proposed the to tax our ringtones to collect more money from us is proposing to take our money to pay for people that make mistakes. People make uh, these camps have been from long time. Now it's crypto. Before it was uh, we kidnap your relative. There's always going to be scams. We have to spend money on educating people not to fall for the scams, not to pay for people's mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Even when you invest in the stock market, are we going to have a fund to or give money back for the people that lost on the stock market? I really apologize that I came into the neutral thing, but I couldn't get to the uh, thing on time for uh, opposition. I'm, I'm opposing this bill. Thank you.
Hello, this is Susan Prophet, and I'm the Vice President of the Nevada Republican Club, but today I am speaking for myself. Um, Dana, I agree with you. You need to kill this bill. And the reason is, um, <laughs> if you want to protect people, who we need to educate them and ban cryptocurrency or both. Uh, the problem with crypto is crypto uh, businesses um, or the government – uh, will ultimately control it, not the owner of the money. And as you stated, this form of money is often used in nefarious purposes. Changing the definition of money won't eliminate the risk of using it either. Regulating it closely, as this bill appears to do, is really the wrong move, in my opinion, having dealt with a crypto owner who was establishing his company. Uh, Dina, <laughs> as, as, um, as, as you suspected, it, it, it has its downfalls. And um, it turned out that this gentleman was a fraud, and the, the red flag that, that tipped me off was that he claimed that Rockefeller was financing it, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, and so um, digital currency will make it impossible for anyone to hide their piggy bank, which I'm sure the government would like. But it also allows the government or whoever is um, the ultimate holder of your money to control the money in the future. And if the communist agenda is forced on this country, the government would be able to determine if and when we could use our own money and what we could use it for. This isn't helping anyone but a totalitarian government like China who needs to be able to control their citizens and keep them from speaking out. So, Dina, I really appreciate you suggesting you can kill the bill. I wish you would. Thank you very much. If you would like to... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> BPS, anyone else? And we like are we are in neutral. neutral. We, thank you. We are neutral. If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 333, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Um, Senator Neal, you have any closing remarks? Okay. Well, um, I thank you for bringing the bill, and um, I'm sure that there are some other people. Senator Stone has a friend who lost a lot of money, and I know a couple of people who have lost a lot of money. It's a brand new technology, and um, unfortunately, whenever something is new, you have good actors, and then you have bad actors. Um, I think one of the ways that, this, that, that could help the image of the industry is for those who are good, um, to make sure that those who are not, make sure that they uh, cease and desist and get out. Um, that'd be good, but I don't know that that's gonna happen. So uh, I thank you for bringing the bill, and I hope that it does pass, because there, there are people um, who need this type of protection, especially in the early days of this, because most people don't even know what it is. So with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 333 and uh, open up, um, for public comment, and you probably saw several of our um, committee members to leave. They have a one o'clock committee meeting, and they have not had lunch. So, uh, and we're we're going to have to get out of here too because they meet in here. So, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll keep it, uh, Chairwoman. I'll keep it very brief. Uh, I just wanted to clarify something on the record, if I could. Um, there were several questions today about whether or not um, parental notification exists in Nevada for a, a minor seeking an abortion, and it doesn't. We, in NRS 442.255 and 2555 are in law, but they were, um, they were there's, there was an injunction on them back in the 80s. We have never had parental notification for underage girls seeking abortion in Nevada. Um, girls as young as eight, nine, 10, how, how, if they can get pregnant, they can get an abortion, surgical or pill abortion, without a parent even knowing. And just last week, um, the legislature of the state of Idaho passed a bill, HB 242, which created a crime of abortion trafficking. And that is an adult um, who takes a child across the border with the intent to get a secret abortion for that child uh, will be guilty of a, um, uh, a crime that, that will, um, 
result in two to five years of, pr of prison, not for, the, not for the woman, not for the child, but for the person who traffics that child across the border. Truly, there is no good reason for an adult to take a child over the border to get any kind of surgical um, or pill abortion unless they're a predator or a bad actor. So thank you very much. Just wanted to clarify that on the record. Hello, I am Jared Horn, a student at the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, I just wanted to sort of express, not specifically about SB uh, 333, but in general, the regulation of cryptocurrency and express sort of support for it. It is a wild west out there, and uh, I would encourage uh, the members of this committee to watch a documentary called Line Goes Up by the uh, content creator Folding Ideas. I think that it, it's very informative about the world of cryptocurrency and sort of the uh, unregulated uh, stock market that they've sort of created for themselves and how it hurts people, and I would like to encourage more regulation and bills concerning it. Uh, but that, that was it. Thank you, and I don't see anyone down south. BPS, we have anyone on the phones? Public comment? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Hi, uh, I apologize again. I don't know if I mentioned my name. I called uh, a few minutes back. Just for the record, I wanted to mention my name, Katrin Ivanov, spelled I, V as a Victor, A, N as a Nancy, O, Frank, Frank. Uh, I did call in the opposition, but I was nervous because it wasn't the time to talk. So I made a forgot to say my name for the record. I apologize. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do, and have a lovely day. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Oh, thank you, BPS, and thank, um, <clears throat> thank you, committee members. Uh, this has been a marathon, I'm sure, but uh, we're getting ready to adjourn, and we will be back here on Friday morning uh, at 8 o'clock. We've got to push a lot of bills out of here before next Friday. So thank you all. Get some lunch. We are adjourned. <laughs>